this is the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. This meeting is being held via teleconference under the government code section 11133. The date is January 25th, 2022, and the time is 9.13 a.m. Public participation. The members of the public that are listening and would like to provide public comment by telephone will be limited to two minutes unless in, the discre in our discretion circumstances require a longer period. However, members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. Res we respect the autocratic administration of time in the service of the democratic distribution of time. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio recorded. Please turn off or silence your phones, and we will now take the roll. Dr. Paris, would you please take the roll? Thank you, Dr. McLean. Uh, Dr. Dion McLean. Present. Dr. David Paris, present. Dr. Lawrence Adams. Present. Ms. Jeanette Cruz. Present. Dr. Pamela Daniels. Present. Mr. Raphael Sweet. Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paris. Um, moving on to the next agenda item, we would like to remind um, as we move on to the hearings and petitioners, we ask that the petitioners do re keep their cameras on. The board members will also keep their cameras on. Um, and if there becomes a bandwidth problems, we will turn our cameras off. And, but if you're speaking or asking a question or making a comment, please turn your camera back on and that's for the board members. But again, the petitioners, we ask that you please keep your camera turned on throughout your hearings. At this time, I'd like to move on to the petitioner hearings and turn this over to the Honorable Judge Gavin. Um, and uh, yes, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. McLean. Uh, as I said, this is Sean Gavin. The, the first petition that we'll hear is Dr. Dahan. Uh, Dr. Dahan and I believe his attorney, Mr. Adams. No, Mr. Brown. Uh, can you both hear me? Dr. Dahan, it looks like you said something, but yes. you're muted. Yes. Uh, there you are. Okay. And is Mr. Brown on the line as well? Yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Adam Brown for Dr. And it's pronounced Dahan, sir. Dayhan, my apologies. Please no accept problem. my apology for mispronouncing your name, Dr. Dayhan. No problem. All right. Um, you were both on the line when I made my uh, statements a moment ago about how this hearing would proceed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Is, yes, sir. If that's the case, Ms. Haro, are you ready to go on the record? I am. Thank you. Mr. Brown, are you ready to go on the record? I am. And Dr. Dayhan, are you ready to go on the record? Yes, sir. And Ms. Straub, are you ready to go on the record? Yes, I am. All right, then we are on the record in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of surrendered license of Daniel Hanania Dehan. This matter is being heard before the California Board of Chiropractic Examiners. My name is Sean Gavin. I'm the administrative law judge assigned to hear this case. This is case number 2014-997. And OAH case number 2021-120848. Can I take the appearances of the parties, starting with counsel for the Deputy Attorney General's office? Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro. And counsel for petitioner? Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Adam Brown for Dr. Dayhan. I'm also with the law offices of Brown and Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Before we went on the hearing, before we went on the record, I explained the hearing procedures that will follow. I will not summarize those again, but I will highlight that it is unnecessary for the parties to explain everything that's in the petition in detail, keeping in mind that the board has already had an opportunity to review the petition. Uh, 
uh, you should limit your comments and argument to matters of rehabilitation. With that in mind, uh, Ms. Haro, would you like to take anything up before we move forward with a presentation of the petition packet and license and disciplinary history? No, I'm ready to present the packet and history when you're when you're ready. All right. Uh, before we begin, let me just say um, before we went on the record, the uh, moderator established a quorum, or Vice Chair Paris established a quorum of the board, and the members who are present do constitute a quorum. With that said, Ms. Harrow, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you. I am Deputy Attorney General Summer Harrow. I'm hearing. I'm appearing today on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I'm here to present and assist in fact finding. My role is not adversarial today, but is intended to protect the public interest. I'm here to ensure that there's adequate information from which to make a decision. I would first like to mark for identification and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the petition packet with accompanying documents. The petitioner has been provided with a copy of the same set of the exhibit. Exhibit 1 consists generally of the petition for reinstatement of a revoked license, which is bait stamped as B as in boy, C as in Charles, E, 1-2. After that is a letter from Adam Brown to the board's enforcement unit dated November 25th, 2020. After that are petitioner's answers to questions one through seven from the petition. There are six letters of support from uh, friends of the petitioner at the business's Transformers, which is spelled T R E. E N D S F O R M E R S. The business momentum business capital. M as in Mary, K S instruments. Global first travel. Deckel capital. Deckel is spelled for the court reporter D E K E L and the Business Bookkeeping and Business Services Group. There are approximately uh, 102 certificates of completion for continuing education, which includes four hours in ethics and 10 hours in coding and billing. After that is the accusation in board case number 2014-997. There's the board's decision and order, which adopted petitioner's stipulated surrender of license. We also have the letter to petitioner giving notice of the hearing along with proof of service dated December 29th, 2021. And another letter uh, giving petitioner notice of the hearing, uh, the petition packet, and the login information for today with proof of service dated January 13th. 2022. Your Honor, at this time, I offer this packet into evidence as Exhibit 1. Mr. Brown, do you object? No. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Thank you. I will now provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. On January 1st, 1989, the board issued chiropractic license number DC. 19744 to petitioner. Petitioner's chiropractic license was revoked pursuant to a stipulated surrender of license, effective August 12th, 2015. On February 6th, 2014, the board filed accusation number 2014-997 against petitioner. That accusation alleged five causes of disciplinary action which were for insurance fraud, unprofessional conduct, endangering the public welfare, unprofessional conduct, commission of acts involving moral turpitude and dishonesty, unprofessional conduct, knowingly making document relating to the practice of chiropractic, which falsely represents the existence of a state of facts, and unprofessional conduct 
participation in acts of fraud and or misrepresentation. The accusation arose from petitioner's submission of false medical documentation and fraudulent bills for medical services that had not been rendered uh, and the submission of those documents to Allstate Insurance Company. That fraud involved a scheme where petitioner and his corporation, PDI, first received x-rays from chiropractors and attorneys throughout the U.S. and digitized them. Petitioner and his corporation then emailed those x-rays to a person designated as a reading radiologist. That reading radiologist would dictate an x-ray pathology report. And meanwhile, an unlicensed PDI employee would create a separate biomechanical report that contained medical findings, opinions, and diagnoses. Petitioner and his corporation then affixed the reading radiologist's name and or signature to the biomechanical report, even though that reading radiologist had never seen the report. Petitioner and PDI provided both the pathology report and the biomechanical port report to the referring chiropractor or attorney, knowing that the documentation would then be submitted to insurance companies in support of a claim against a policy of insurance. The accusation also arose from petitioner's creation of false billing statements in a scheme to assist persons making personal injury claims and to help chiropractors increase their personal injury referrals from attorneys. This scheme involved generating fraudulent bills for medical services that were not provided, and petitioner did this by upcoding, double and triple billing for services rendered, and billing for the interpretation of more x-rays than existed for a particular patient. Petitioner also used the names of licensed physicians without their authorization on billing statements. Some examples of the fraudulent billing included billing for face-to-face -face evaluations when PDI and the reading radiologist had never actually met or spoke with the patient. Petitioner also billed for the delivery, fitting, and adjustment of devices, including orthotics, which PDI did not do. And petitioner would bill for the interpretation of more x-rays than actually existed for a given patient. On July 13, 2015, the board adopted petitioner's stipulated surrender of license and issued a decision and order revoking that license. The decision became effective on August 12, 2015. In the stipulated surrender, which was adopted by the board, on page four, paragraph six, petitioner agreed that if he should ever petition for reinstatement of a license, then all of the charges and allegations in the accusation would be deemed true, correct, and admitted by petitioner. Petitioner is now petitioning for reinstatement of his license. And because the burden is on petitioner, I have no further statements, but reserve the right to question petitioner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taro. Mr. Brown, that takes us to petitioner's case in chief. How would you like to proceed? Uh, if Your Honor, if I may, I'd like to give a very, very brief opening and uh, yield as much time as possible to Dr. Dahan for questioning by uh, any of the members if they desire. Yep, you can begin when you're ready. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, um, uh, board members and uh, public members attending, um, as well as uh, AG Harrow. It's nice to see you again, of course. Um, we are here as an open book today. Um, Dr. Dahan is an exceptional man. He is uh, one of the clients we have had who has had the most active uh, interim activity since revocation that I have seen in many years. He is a rabbi. He is a father of seven. Uh, he is a, um, a husband, and he is a very, very um, committed and decent man who acknowledges the errors of his ways previously that led to the revocation of his license back in 2015. Um, however, I believe without going into great amount of detail, we would call the uh, commit the uh, board's attention to exhibits A1 through A7, which really comprise the crux of our case today. 
um, which are the answers to the, the questions we're here to answer today, which is basically why do you deserve reinstatement? Uh, as those answers uh, clearly show, Dr. Dahan has used his time since revocation uh, very productively, uh, including his work with uh, Consultants of America, a national management and consulting firm for healthcare practitioners with over 1,256 clients in 45 states. He will testify to the details of that. Um, he, has, he has produced voluminous amounts of podcasts, uh, self-improvement uh, videos. He's even written a book uh, in the interim. So without further delay or ado, I believe that Dr. Dahan will provide you with the best evidence of his uh, activities which warrant a reinstatement of his license. I certainly believe uh, that he has done everything in his power, perhaps more so than most of my clients, to uh, to uh, warrant uh, reinstatement. With that, I would turn it over to uh, to the uh, board for any questioning. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Dr. Dahan has nothing to hide. He's an open book. And uh, I hope you will consider reinstatement of his uh, chiropractic license. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, that is an opening statement. You still have the ability to call Dr. Dahan as a witness if you'd like. If you choose not to, then I would turn it over to Ms. Harrow to begin cross-examination, followed by any board questions. Is that your uh, preference, Mr. Brown? That is my preference, Your Honor. In the interest of time, I would prefer to go that route, yes. Okay. So, Ms. Haro, um, you will have the chance to question Dr. Dahan first. Ms. Uh, Dr. Dahan, I'll need to swear you in, so please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm, under penalty of perjury, that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I affirm. Thank you. You can put your hand down if you'd like. And let me just advise the parties, please speak 10% slower than you think you need to, so that our court reporter and clearly hear what's being said. She's a very talented court reporter, but she's, um, I can, I'm keeping an eye on her and I, I wanna make sure that she's able to accurately transcribe here. So with that said, Ms. Harrow, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you. Mr. Is it Dahan? Dahan, yes. Dahan, yeah. You submitted several support letters uh, with your petition. And those authors state in their letters that they knew you surrendered your chiropractic license. Do all of those authors of the letters know that the accusation leading to your surrender alleged that you had committed fraud? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, your counsel mentioned the your responses to the questions in the petition. And I'd like to talk about your answer to question number two, specifically found at uh, document stamped BCE6. And the sixth paragraph on there. In your answer to this question, Mr. Dehan, you uh, went through a lot of your background. And at paragraph six specifically after talking about the lawsuits all state filed against you for fraud you stated that you knew very well that you had done everything correctly and ethically those lawsuits by all state were for the same conduct that led to the revocation of your license correct uh, what you mean those the three different lawsuits? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm not sure what you knew what you mean. There are three separate lawsuits in three separate states. Okay, well, let's talk about the California lawsuit by all state. Okay. Was that lawsuit for fraud? That's correct. Okay. And your license in California was revoked for fraud, correct? That's correct. Your answer here to question two says that you knew you did everything correctly and ethically. Do you still stand by that statement? Yes, ma'am. On paragraph eight of this same document, so we're on BCE six, 
I, that paragraph talks about advice you had gotten from your attorney during the law state, law, all state lawsuit. And you say that your attorney advised you to close the case by giving all state a nominal settlement in exchange for an agreement that all state would not pursue your license. Are you aware that entering into a settlement agreement which prohibits a party from filing a complaint with the board is itself grounds for disciplinary action? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. In that all state lawsuit in California, there is a $7 million judgment entered against you, correct? That's correct. Okay. On the next page, BCE7, at the third paragraph, you say that you have always upheld the highest level of ethics and integrity in all your work. When did you write these answers to these questions, approximately? Probably about a year ago. Okay. And when was the $7 million judgment for fraud entered against you? five or six years ago. Okay. Do you still stand by the statement in your response that you have always upheld the highest levels of ethics and integrity in your work? I believe so, yes. I'd like to go now uh, to uh, your response to question four which starts at BCE8. Question four had asked for your rehabilitative and corrective measures you've taken, and you outlined uh, community service you did or have done over the last three years, which is teaching uh, courses to young entrepreneurs. Uh, you've taught classes on how to manage and operate a successful business, including protocols to conduct business. Um, you've done some manuals on marketing and clinic management. How, how are these courses different from the courses you taught before your license was revoked? I believe that before the license was revoked, with all due respect, I always upheld but whatever I believe was appropriate. I think in the in the lawsuit, the three of them, and there was a fourth one, by the way, which was uh, which was dismissed by all state. I think they taught me throughout all this experience that basically, no matter what I had done. It had to be better, literally. And so by that, I wanted to make sure that in the compliance issue, for instance, in this manual which I created, we manage over 1,256 centers in 45 states. My job as a senior consultant is to make sure that each and every single office operates appropriately, ethically, legally, in every way possible. So. I focused a lot more in the last several years on ensuring that there would be absolutely no mistake whatsoever, unequivocally, no negligence, no overseeing of anything. That if there was a billing that went out, it had to be 100% audible so that whatever happened, the billing was appropriate, accurate, and correct. So. I focused all the efforts in the last several years to make sure that those things which all state had claimed, whether I believe or not, I was guilty. I think it's clear in my letter, but no matter what it is that they claim, I wanted to make sure since it led to their surrendering of my own license, that there was never happen again, that nothing in this case would ever come up for questioning. And so I focused on my efforts in the last several years, including today. In the book, in the book list that I've written, 
in the talks that I have. I just came back last week from a, uh, you know, presentation to 247 providers in Phoenix, Arizona. The focus of all my lectures, the consulting that we do, everything that we have is geared towards making sure that these errors and mistakes never happen ever. Thank you. On, in response to your question, in your response to question two, on, I'm looking at exhibit, or exhibit one, uh, page BCE7. In paragraph four, <laughs> you, it reads, today I can honestly say that I am extremely sorry and remorseful for what has transpired from all those years of extensive litigation and costly legal battles. Are you sorry at all for the great business practices that you conducted with PDI? Am I sorry about owning PDI? I'm sorry about the question. I'm not sure I understand. Am I sorry about sure. <clears throat> The accusation that led to the surrender and revocation of your license was for the fraudulent billing practices that you and your corporation PDI engaged in. Are you sorry at all for those business practices that you conducted? 100% unequivocally, absolutely, yes. And the reason is because when I have brought PDI onto the consulting, it was actually to help the doctors have x-rays read appropriately by board certified radiologists. So it would support the medical necessity for those treatment rendered. And my negligence, which I admit today, the contracts which we had with the radiologists was not as specific as it should have been. And therefore, and unfortunately, um, these doctors claimed that they weren't responsible for that. But in reality, if I had been given the chance, which again, my fault, my attorney at the last the lawsuit took uh, in this lawsuit specifically um, five and a half weeks in court every single day, not being able to do anything else, but sit there and listen to all of the attorneys from all state bash in every single way, everything that I had done, we had 582 pages worth of answers to rebut every single claim that they had brought. It was a few minutes. At the end of the trial, it was my time to get on the bench and my attorney advised me not to go that route. That he had spoken to counsel from Allstate, spoken to the judge, and that since Allstate in the 10 years of PDI's existence, had only paid $110,000 to PDI. That's it, 110. That they had agreed that it would be treble damages so as not to create even more expenses in legal rebuttal, and therefore accept the treble damages, it would be about $400,000, and then we would be done and walk away. And we had written letters from Allstate that my license would not be jeopardized in any way, my home would not be touched, and we would walk away. And that was as long as I closed PDI, which is what we agreed to. And fortunately, as you could see, that was not what the judge agreed to because when I sat on that bench, I literally sat for seven minutes. The court records will show that. Seven minutes, the judge asked me why I would not defend myself and my attorney spoke to the judge and agreed that, you know, we would walk away because my records clean. And so we anticipated that this would be the judgment, treble damages and finished. Several months later, I was asked by Allstate to sign a letter stating that I was responsible for what had happened. My attorney suggested I sign it and we did. And then months later, we got the $7 million lawsuit which we did not expect. But even that, I had accepted to close PDI, which we did, and walk away. It wasn't but a few months after there was no more time for us to file an appeal. 
that all state now filed another claim, which is not listed in here, by the way, another claim against me and to ensure that our home would be taken as a possession in the settlement. It took us two years with yet another law firm and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees to defend ourselves because the agreement which we had. And on top of it, a few months later, I got a letter from the board stating that my license was being revoked. Yet we have letters from all state and an agreement that my license, if I had agreed to that judgment, would not come into play. And so I was forced again to hire yet another law firm. And Mr. Brown and I met, spoke about this case. And to be honest with you, I was adamant that I would take up the case and fight it. Mr. Brown advised me that this would not be a good idea. And therefore, in this case, it would cost a lot of money, which I didn't have at that time anymore. And therefore, just let the license go. I want you to know, with all due respect, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time that I'm given today. I'm truly grateful for that. I'm humbled by this, by this whole thing. The very first time, you have to understand that all state has been after me for 20 years, 20 years. It was the very first time when I was with my attorney, with the district attorney's office representative in front of that judge, and they asked me whether or not I was going to pursue or just surrender my license. The very first time in the 20 years of this litigation, 20 years, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet I won all the other suits, but I actually broke down and cried. I, I cried because I just couldn't believe what was happening. This was contrary to everything we had agreed. But I knew that this was still the same ploy that Allstate had used. So there was nothing I could do. I, I just knew that I couldn't change what happened. I just couldn't. I didn't have any more money. I just couldn't. The lawsuit, lawsuit in New Jersey lasted 19 years, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We lost a suit. We appealed it. We won on the appeals process. Allstate took it to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Even the American Medical Association joined us as an amicus brief. We had everything on our side. The attorney also, who was also being sued, was from the second largest health law firm in the country. We were just being pursued and Allstate was not gonna give up. And what's interesting is that I'm a consultant to over 1,200 clinics throughout the country and we possibly have maybe less than 2% in all the clinics of personal injury. It's really strange, but we were told and I don't have any problem sharing this today. We were told from the leading prosecuting attorney from all states, unequivocally, in a room between our attorneys and myself, that there was someone at all state that was just not going to let me go. They couldn't give us a reason. They were just not going to let me go. They had something against Dr. Dehan chiropractor. That's all he could tell us. It was not at the end of the 20 years and we were settling this matter that the attorney called and said, by the way, this person is no longer with, with Allstate. We will close this case. And we did. Just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to that attorney again. We actually became friends. Today, I'm even an expert witness in multiple cases defending both on the side of the prosecution and on the side of the defending doctors, cases about fraud. I, I can't I can't explain more than what happened. I, I don't know. It's this is what happened. I couldn't fight more than this. We fought in New Jersey and we won. We fought in North Carolina and we won. We fought against Allstate taking our home and we won. In this case, just felt with counsel's advice,
just surrender the license and admit it. But honestly, in my heart and who I am and what I do, it didn't happen. We have 500 pages that I'd be happy to send to the board for you to see all the answers to all the accusations. I was just not given the opportunity to defend myself. My attorney clearly came to me a few minutes. Imagine being in the court for five weeks every single day and waiting for my turn to come to rebut and explain everything that had happened and showing the contracts. Contracts we proved that the radiologists were board certified and yet allowed PDI to bill for those services. We had all the proofs. We had all the reasons. We had all the paperwork, all the documentation, everything to show to the judge. It would have taken another few weeks. My attorney felt that it was not necessary because those few mistakes that we made, as some business some you know sometimes do, 100% is not possible always, that they would just accept the treble damages. So with all due respect, and I, I don't mean to go on too long, but it's hard for me to not feel remorseful. Of course I am. This whole thing has humbled me tremendously. As a matter of fact, I wrote a 500 page book. 500. Dr. Dr. Dayhan, this is ALJ Gavin. I'm going to interrupt you there and, and invite Ms. Harlow to ask her next question. Thank you, Mr. Dayhan. Uh, as you sit here today, do you think that there was nothing wrong with the way you and PDI conducted business as alleged in the accusation? No, I cannot say that. No, there were there were things which were should have been much better. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Judge, I don't have any further questions. I turn it over to the board for questioning. All right. Dr. McLean, is it your preference to um, to have members raise their digital hands or shall I just do a roll call to see if members have questions? Um, I, I think a roll call will be better, Your Honor. All right. Uh, then I will start with you, Dr. McLean. Do you have any questions for the petitioner? Fantastic. Yes, I do, actually. Um, and thank you, um, well, Mr. Dayhan. I will try to keep mine brief and make them such that they are easy and short answers, uh, hopefully. Um, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss this, but did you have you paid the cost of recovery to the board? Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, so if you will, it should, the cost of recovery should be listed in your packet. Um, it's sent out with all of your documents to that the board sends out to you, um, which also explains your disciplinary action as well as the process here. In any case, if you can't find it, it's probably it's I have it on page my page first page here of my petition. I don't know where it would be on yours. It um, states that your cost of recovery to the board should also be in your uh, accusation that the board sent to you originally. I'm sure um, that your attorney should have that as well. Your um, Honor, excuse me. I, I'm, I'm completely lost uh, respectfully as to what Ms. McLean is referring to, Dr. McLean is referring to. Could you give me a little more specificity as to what you're, you're, you're referring to, please, Dr. McLean? Okay, so. Dr. McLean, I, I can maybe help. I, don't okay. mean to I can maybe help. Uh, in petition packet, BCE 126, that's the order following the stipulated surrender and paragraph five of the order ordered Dr. Dehan to reimburse the board $12,000 for its reasonable costs of investigation and enforcement matter. And I believe Dr. McLean is asking whether Dr. Dehan has paid that amount. Dr. McLean, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but that's, that's how no, I that's interpret it. That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. I just didn't know where exactly in the petition packet it was. Thank you. Your Honor, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Forgive me. I, I, I want to be clear. If you're referring to paragraph five on BCE 126, which I believe you are, that language states that the uh, 
cost amount of 12000 is to be paid prior to the issuance of a new or reinstated license, correct? Not, at, not after, but prior, correct? All right, and the question is just, has that amount been paid? All right, fair enough. The answer is no, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Dr. McLean, do you have additional questions? Yes, actually. So, uh, Mr. Dahan, you have testified here today that you felt that you had behaved appropriately and ethical in your practices. Um, do you feel that fraud is appropriate or ethical? No. Um, you've also stated that you are an expert witness. Can you tell me who you are an expert witness for? There are cases, as you know, we manage, as you might, might know, we manage clinics throughout the country. And um, because of my extensive knowledge, which I've acquired over the years, I've been a consultant now for 28 years. I was in practice for a little less than 10 and consultant for the last 28 years. We've been contacted by several offices um, whereby they have filed either against the chiropractor or the chiropractor has filed uh, against an insurance company. And I actually have been referred to as an expert witness in those cases where I answer questions, review records um, for Medicare. With compliance. I understand. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. I understand. So you say your your statement is or your answer is that you have been called as an expert witness by individual doctor's offices to which you consult regular have consulted with, not correct. insurance companies or anything like that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I just a couple more things. Um you stated that you are now um Part of your recovery, you state that you now make sure that all billings will be done appropriately without errors. How have you, how do you plan on making sure that that occurs? Or what are you speaking of when you talk about, when you said um, that you make sure now that they are done appropriately? Sure, thank you for the question. Indeed, we have two compliance officers full time that work with us. Uh, there are certified compliance officers. We also have three certified coders who verify all the codes. Now, mind you, we don't do the billing or the coding for any of the offices at all. And of course, PDI has been closed many years ago. We just advise the doctors on what is appropriate and most appropriate to do and accurately in the most truthful way. So with these compliance officers and these coders, along with healthcare attorneys, we always make sure that our clients are able to do these things appropriately today. So um, let me just rephrase this. So you're speaking about what you do with your clients. My question is for you, as if your license is reinstated, what will you do for yourself regarding billing practices and making sure that it's done properly? Obviously, again, you can imagine the remorse that I feel given all of that. So I have absolutely no intention of A, making a mistake and B, not being being negligent in any way, shape or form. But I also have access to these compliance officers, these coders and healthcare attorneys. So if anything was to be built in any way, shape or form, I will ensure that this will never happen, not in any way or any possible negligence by all means. And um, just one last question, um, because the, I think the deputy AG has covered everything else for me. Um, why, what I'm not seeing um, in here is why we, we should reinstate your license in your opinion. I, I see in here that you um, mention all of your accolades and that you're a great speaker and a great entrepreneur and a nice person um, as stated in these letters. But as a doctor of chiropractic, I want to know what, what, why you want us to reinstate your license. The opportunity that I have today, I influence hundreds of doctors nationwide from all of these things that I have done from the talks 
that I give, the podcast that I've created, thousands of uh, subscribers to the YouTube channel. I believe that I've helped chiropractic since it's been my greatest pride. I've had two prides in my life. One is the day that I became an American citizen. I'm from France. I'm from Paris, France. I came to this country when I was 17. So that was the very first bride in my life, become, becoming an American citizen. And the second was becoming a chiropractor. It's been tremendous success for me, tremendous opportunity to treat patients, see patients, help patients. And by diversifying what I have done, I was able to reach out so many more people by integrating the clinics and opening up the doors. So I believe that I have done tremendous help. Mind you, I am quite aware and embarrassed and even ashamed of what happened. I didn't expect it. I didn't anticipate it. And I certainly did not know it was coming this way. But it happened. And my job today is to make sure this never happens again. And the truth is, with all due respect, again, I'm 65 years old. I have maybe 20, 30 years to go. If I were to live that long, my focus would be to make sure that whatever was done on the pride of me gaining that license, having the privilege of having that license, will now be transformed into an opportunity to do everything the appropriate way so that this would never happen again, not to me, and not to other doctors, because that's the biggest emphasis today as well, as I make sure that none of the other doctors ever do this. And I, this is why everybody knows my story. This story, by the way, is posted on our website. It's posted everywhere. I make it a point to tell my story to every single doctor at every single lecture so that they understand never to make those mistakes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, Dr. Paris, any questions? I do. I, I just have, uh, a, I guess, a clarification. Um, and thank you for being here today, Dr. Dehan. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm having a real conflict in understanding why you're remorseful. And is it because you um, are remorseful for, and if I read from the first cause for discipline, BCE 118, first paragraph, created a scheme to knowingly manufacture fraudulent medical reports, or is it your statement that that was a um, contractual, overlooked contractual issue? So the contracts themselves allowed us to do those things, but they weren't clear. So I'm remorseful for the fact that I did not, I did not fulfill exactly what should have done. I am definitely grateful for what happened on that. But the concepts were very... Please finish, I apologize. I'm sorry, the contracts were written in the way that was supposed to expose to what was supposed to happen. It just wasn't clear. So would you deny the statement to this board that you, that you did in fact create a scheme to knowingly manufacture fraudulent medical reports? I can't deny this today because, again, I've signed a letter stating that whatever was written on the um, accusation to be truthful and accurate. So without going into all the details, knowing that I didn't defend myself, and I, at the end of the day, bottom line is this was the judgment. This was what happened. I admit it. I recognize it. I regret it. And I've worked for the last several years making sure this would never happen again. Would I be correct in interpreting, though, that ev even though that was the path that this case took, in your heart and mind, you, you do not directly believe that to be true? No, I do believe that is true. I do believe in my mind and in my heart this is what happened. After all, this is my name. I can't oversee everything, but what happened is my mistake. I did make those mistakes. I did not make them to the extent that it's showing, but the mistakes were made. And therefore, 
I admitted on paper and signed specifically stating that, yes, I admit the errors were made and that I'm remorseful for them, regretful, and I've been humbled by this whole thing over the years. And now all I can do is never repeat them again, make sure that whatever happened is now never in my way and better than just doing it myself, teaching also others that they never do it. So and you should know with all due respect again, that in all the lectures, I admit to every single doctors, including last week, 247 or oh, close to 250 people were in all healthcare providers. I admit it of what happened. I don't make a claim that it didn't happen. I wanted to express to the board that I wish I had the opportunity to explain more during my court case. I just didn't. I just did not. But the mistakes happened. And and you would consider the uh, creating a scheme to knowingly manufacture fraudulent medical reports. That was a mistake in the contracts when you were signed. Okay. Um, and so just one more thing. Uh, so were the on BCE 119 second paragraph, the billing and coding the CPT codes that included face-to-face -face examination um, and then in B, the uh, orthotics uh, billing statement CP code for delivery, fitting and adjustment of device, devices including orthotics, PDI did not perform any services. Were those also, is your statement also that those were contractual uh, mistakes? No, if I may explain, since you asked a question about these two, when it comes to the face-to-face, -face, you have to understand that I did not purchase, I did not create the software. The software was purchased from another company. The company did the billing for us. So those codes didn't come from us. The codes came from the company which billed for the service. But I own the company. So I took that blame, unfortunately. As far as the orthotics is concerned, the explanation to that is that there was a conveyance fee when the x-rays were sent from the doctor to PDI, there's a conveyance fee. And if you look at the description of that code, you will see that there is transfer of conveyance. That's the wording that is used for those codes. And therefore, the shipping of the x-rays were the codes that we used. And fortunately, during the court case, only the first part of that code was described to the judge, not the rest of the code, which clearly stated that the x-rays were mailed from PDI to the doctors and from the doctors to PDI. So that is that code. Understood. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paris. That takes us to Dr. Adams. Any questions? Yes, I do. Good morning, uh, Mr. Dahan. Uh, thank you for being here and um, your candidness so far. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice. Can you hear me okay, yes. Dr. Dahan? Thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I had a question about the uh, $7 million ju judgment. Um, have you paid that back? I did not have the $7 million or or a tenth of that. Uh, the court case was settled. Um, without the seven million. How, how did you discharge that judgment then? We met with, uh, with the attorneys and agreed not to, that I would not disparage all state, not disclose any of the information. And then we settled. We had a couple buildings which we owned by selling those buildings and um, them taking the money, which was a little less than a million and that satisfied the judgment and the whole judgment was dismissed and cleared. It's no longer in any records. Thank you. Um, I took the time to watch a few of your YouTube videos and uh, to listen to uh, some of the podcasts. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, uh, during the YouTube videos, I did not notice any disclosure of your status with the board disclosed during your YouTube videos. 
Um, and you regularly referred to yourself as Dr. Dahan. Yes, I have a PhD also in nutrition. Um, and I called myself Dr. Dahan, never claiming to be licensed. Like I said, if that question ever came up, I would certainly, since I'm not practicing, I would certainly tell that to everyone. But at the same time, um, in all aspects of everything that I do, whenever it's appropriate, it's about letting them know of what happened. Um, I can't make that statement, obviously, every single day because it may not be appropriate, especially on YouTube videos. If I was speaking about a certain concept, I didn't think it was appropriate to mention anything else. But at any time, any time, any lectures that we gave the doctors, I use this as a tool to teach the doctors. I use this as a tool to inform the doctors of what could happen and what did happen to me, because it did last over 20 years. Thank you. Um, the 1,256 offices you said that you consult with, are they aware of your uh, license re revocation in California? Every single office knows of that. Um, and that's because, first of all, all this off these offices are come to seminars. And this, we keep on telling that story. We always make sure that they're aware of who I am, what I've done. And honestly, this has been a great opportunity for me to even tell the story, which, believe it or not, attracted even more clients, knowing that I've gone through all these legal issues. Thank you. Thank you. Do you continue to refer to yourself as Dr. Dahan when you consult and when you when you teach? Everybody knows me as Dr. Dahan. Uh, I think I also have uh, a lot of information because of my homeopathic background. As I mentioned, I was raised in France before I came to this country. I have a huge amount of information because of my PhD in nutrition. So I think everybody knows me as Dr. Dahan, but nobody comes to me as a chiropractor per se, since I don't practice at all. Thank you. Um, your CEs, you, you list your CEs. Since the revocation of your license, it appears that you did just a three-day stretch of CEs from July 6th to July 9th, 2020. Is there any other continuing education that you took from the time of your revocation until now, almost six years? So when I was made aware that I needed to catch up on all the hours in the package, which you should have, I'm not sure if you see it here, there are over 140 hours to catch up, which I did either live and I followed, my, my attorney advised me of how many hours needed to be live Zoom, how many hours needed to be on the internet. I took all those courses and caught up and even included this one year coming up, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. And a final question, how are you keeping your skills sharp in preparation for returning to practice? Well, again, I visit offices. I just got back last night from another office. So I visit all the offices that we've mentioned. They're across 45 states. So not only do I have to take courses, so I see uh, in manipulation and following up and everything, but I also spend in each office one day. So I travel extensively because of that. Are you adjusting any patients? I'm not adjusting any patients. I have not been license for all those few years. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Dr. Adams. That takes us to Dr. Daniels. Any questions for the petitioner? Uh, yes, I do. Good morning, Dr. Dehan. You can hear me okay? Yes. Thank okay. You. Um, so many of my questions have already been addressed uh, by the previous members. I guess I'm would like a little more clarification. I'm still having a hard time understanding uh, what you, why you think you are here. You um, wrote on BCE page six with the DAJ address that you were sorry for 
the litigation, but I didn't really see or have heard um, what has made you humble and what exactly you are sorry for. I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, why you think you are here and what is it exactly um, that you did wrong? So in, in creating the business, which I did, and having it in the profession, of which I truly believe in and the pride of what I had done, I knew for a fact I had to do everything in my power to do it properly, and I didn't. I misjudge some of my developments. I misjudge or was negligent in some of the things that should have been done appropriately. And because of that, I was caught. It's a mistake. I'm regretful for that. I didn't expect it. I did not intentionally or I was not focused on making sure that I would make those mistakes. I did not intentionally defraud the system. I didn't think about a scheme. I didn't think about that. I was just negligent. I did things and that's a mistake. And because of those, unfortunately, as I just mentioned about uh, the codes, had had they not, had we checked the codes, they would not have been those codes on face-to-face. -face. They would not have, had I checked that. But I trusted the people, and therefore, it's my negligence. I own the company. I controlled it. And mind you, the company, that company didn't make any money, but that's besides the point. But I should have checked that. Those are the mistakes. There are these mistakes which are listed in there. And for that, I had to pay the price. And I did. So to be clear, you're saying that you did not intentionally uh, make these uh, so-called billing mistakes. You did not know at the time that those were erroneous uh, billing errors. Correct. It was not a scheme. It was not something that I intended to do. There were either errors of negligence or stupid errors of lack of focus or pay attention. And I took responsibility for it. And I do today. And that's why I signed the letter to the board stating I accept it. But when the it was happening, you're saying that you did not see those billing face-to-face, -face, the orthotics, using somebody else's uh, license without their knowing that you did not see those as uh, fraudulent? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, with all due respect, a long question because, and I, I don't want to take too much time to answer, but we had answers of what had happened. I had mentioned there's over 500 pages. We could have answered a lot of those questions at the court case. We, we weren't given this opportunity because my attorney declined, but there were answers to a lot of these questions, and it would have been minimized to just a few mistakes. The, the scheme to defraud is not a mistake. It didn't happen. It, I did make mistakes, yes. That is, I have to admit. I want to be truthful. I want to be honest. This was okay. a mistake. Thank you. I just have uh, one more question. So um, you seem extremely, you know, busy and successful. And so I'm just curious, you know, you mentioned that you were 65. And at this point, um, why do you want your license back? If if you did get your license back, what's the next step that you're going to do? Are you going to be going into practice? Obviously, this uh, whole concept and these lawsuits have taken pretty much everything away from us financially. It's been extremely difficult. We had to renegotiate everything that we had. The couple of buildings which we had owned because of our success in the last several years, we had to sell everything. I, I need the license A, to practice, B, the ability to put after my name, which I believe something which I earned over all the years, and C, the ability also to tell the story, keep on telling the stories to everybody else of what happened. And given my age, I don't know how many years I have left. I don't know. Thank God I'm still healthful. I'm still in good shape. So I'm hoping it'll be quite a few. But that's really my goal. If I can, it'll be a long haul. 
It'll be difficult. It's going to be costly. But all of this complicated with the last two years of COVID, which have made things even more difficult, I really intend to open up my own practice again, as I did before, and do the best that I can to treat as many patients as possible the way that I started this whole profession to begin with. Thank you. No more questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. That brings us then to Ms. Cruz. Any questions for the petitioner? All my questions have been asked, so no questions here. All right, thank you, Ms. Cruz. That brings us finally to Mr. Sweet. Any questions for the petitioner? The same for me, no further questions. All right, um, that concludes then the board questions. Mr. Brown, do you have any follow-up questions for your client? Uh, yes, just a couple, Your Honor, if I may. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Dahan, without a, a lot of depth, I, I just want to, I want to be clear, um, as you stated in your response to the questions asked in your petition, um, specifically at page BCE6, Dr. Dahan, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Specifically at BCE6, uh, you stated that your defense in the California suit lasted seven minutes. Were you referring to your time on the stand as a witness in that statement? That is correct. Okay, and and just so I'm clear, your attorney at the time advised you not to proceed further with a defense in that case, or what did you mean by that when you say that you followed the advice of counsel regarding the seven minutes and the short defense? Can you explain what you mean by that briefly, please? Sure. My attorney believed that um, most of the allegations that were made were not truthful and inaccurate, and therefore... He spent the time with counsel from Allstate, as well as to, with the judge, in coming up with an easy solution on how to end this. He also knew that I couldn't afford a couple hundred thousand dollars with an appeal in case we lost. And he realized that this was going to be another two or three weeks, possibly, maybe more, we didn't know, of defense. So he, he decided this is going to be an easy case. They're going to slap you with a, and this was his term, slap you with a trouble damages, and you'll admit to what you did, and then we're done. They've agreed, Allstate has agreed, not to pursue your license, and therefore you'll be able to practice, and you'll keep your home, and we'll just settle. This was literally at the time, after five and a half weeks worth of court case, I was to be on the stand, it was gonna last a couple of weeks, and my attorney said, can stop. The judge was quite surprised. It's all in the record. Okay, Dr. Dahan, did you object with your attorney privately or openly in court to this to this defense strategy? Did you express displeasure or concern about that approach? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I thought we could have explained everything, and in my opinion, the case would have been either dismissed or we would have won. Please, given us the opportunity to explain ourselves, but. I followed his advice and unfortunately we see what happened. Do you regret following that advice now, as you sit here today? I do. Okay. Dr. Dahan, a couple closing questions. Why do you, I believe this question was asked, but what, what are your intentions specifically if your license is granted? What, what is it that you, you hope to do with regard to have, possessing a license and using that license? What are your specific plans if you have any, do you intend to treat patients? In other words, uh, open a practice, how soon? What, what are your intentions specifically? So first and foremost, obviously, is the ability to consult, keep on consulting and tell the doctors more of what I do today. I am a consultant. This has been for many years. Depending on the finances, what I can come up with, if possible, um, and if need be, because I'm trying again to navigate myself through my age and my responsibilities. I'm a father of seven children. I'm a grandfather of 18 grandchildren. So it's not so simple. It is possibly to open up a practice, which I would love. It was always my dream. I had a very, very successful practice. I had two of them. This is what brought me to become a consultant to begin with. So this will be in the future. Whether or not I would reach that, I don't know. 
right now, my main goal is to keep on working as a consultant to broaden even to more and reach out to more clinics than we have. The number is not 1,256, by the way, anymore. We're now reached over 1,300 and keep on growing in that direction. Dr. Dehan, would you would you say that uh, what you've been through with regard to these multiple lawsuits, the accusation against you several years ago by the board, settling that matter, surrendering your license, would you agree that this experience has possibly made you even more aware and hyper-conscious of the dangers of, of potentially fraudulent billing or some of the allegations that have made, been made against you in the accusation and in the lawsuits against you? Has that, in other words, has that heightened your awareness of how to properly practice chiropractic? 100%. I mean, even more than that, just to to think, not even an email, no letter goes out from my office without disclaimers. There's not a book, a, a publication, an answer without disclaimers. I mean, we are extremely careful. Not, it, I can even tell you a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we fired a person because they had sent a booklet which I had written on protocols and the disclaimers were not there. I'm extremely careful today. There's not a day that goes by, not one day that goes by, which I don't live with what happened. I see it every day. I didn't expect it. I didn't anticipate it. And I certainly did not intentionally cause it. It happened. Now, the only thing I can do is make amends. And I've tried everything I can in the last several years. That's why the books, the videos, the classes, the, the presentations, the, the booklets that I've written, the compliance manuals, Everything is geared towards never, ever making that mistake and never anyone else should make that mistake. Dr. Dan, would you say, in other words, that you've learned your lesson from this whole experience? Is that how you feel? I have. And believe me, Mr. Brown, I don't wish what happened to me of what I've gone through to anyone, not even my worst enemies. It was 20 years. That's what it lasted. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Honor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> I take it then, Ms. Hara, you don't have any additional questions. Is that right? Correct. All right. That takes us then to closing remarks. Ms. Hara, you may go first if you have any closing remarks to make. No closing remarks. All right. Mr. Brown, would you like to make any closing argument? Uh, yes, briefly, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, members of the board, um, Attorney General uh, Harrow, and public uh, viewers, uh, we thank you for your time and consideration of the uh, instant petition for reinstatement that Dr. Dehan has filed uh, today. Uh, I believe that the evidence has showed, or the evidence has shown, that Dr. Dehan is remorseful. Uh, he has explained some of the uh, intricacies of that remorse with regard to the allegations against him, which we understand were somewhat unclear. I believe that has been clarified uh, by Dr. Dehan. He is um, certainly here as a humble, uh, remorseful, changed man, who I believe the evidence has showed will not make the same mistakes again. He is uh, ready and willing to comply with any terms and conditions that may be placed upon his return to practice. And he is certainly ready to resume his life as a father of seven, a rabbi, and a, just a genuinely nice guy if he is given the uh, honor and privilege of returning to chiropractic. He has learned his lesson. He's sorry. There's no question about that. We humbly and respectfully ask, therefore, that the board consider reinstatement of Dr. Dehan's chiropractor license without delay. Um, with that, I thank you on behalf of myself and Dr. Dehan for your time. We understand the um, the. Uh, the uh, gravity of the task before you, but uh, I believe the evidence has shown overwhelmingly Dr. Dehan is rehabilitated with regard to the factors required. He has submitted adequate uh, CE proof. Uh, he has provided testimony of his character and remorse, and I believe that should satisfy the board that he is certainly uh, appropriate for return to practice. And with that, I have nothing further and thank everyone for their time today. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brown, is the matter submitted? It is. Ms. Harrow? Submitted. It is. Then the matter is submitted. The case is closed and we are off the record. Thank you.
All right, um, Dr. McLean, I know that you have an interest in probably moving forward with uh, your next petition hearing. I do, however, need to give our court reporter a brief break. I also need to see if she needs any spellings from uh, Dr. Dayhan, his attorney. Um, sure, that's I'm certainly so fine. If we we can take a five minute break um, to prepare all the documents that you need, would that be sufficient? I, Mr. Alba, I'll leave that to you. Is five minutes adequate? Did, um, I, I'd appreciate 10 if I could, please. Dr. McLean, does 10 work for you? Okay. Okay. So um, I don't know if our next petition hearing or the next participants are ready, but I'll, I'll plan on. I'll, I'll be back. Anyway. I'll come on as soon as I can. I just, um, I have one and phone call I have to make. Okay. And just and so that you know, um, typically we plan to um, give a little longer break um, uh, afterwards, just so that you know that there are other breaks coming up so we can um, move forward accordingly. So we'll take 10 minutes now, but from this point on, we'll sh probably shorten those until we get to our longer break. Okay. And I was Stroud, told we were only going till noon. Is that not true? I think that's the hope. There are three petitions oh. that we, we're trying to get through here. Oh, okay. Because it's already 10 30. So I didn't know that she's talking uh, about longer breaks. I thought that maybe you guys were planning on going into the afternoon. No, that's that's for the board, the rest of the board, just letting them know. But for, oh, oh, for the petitioners, no, we will cut we will try to cut this off um by noon. Um so we hope to move expeditiously through these and that's why I'm asking if you can take a shorter break that would be beneficial to keep us on target. I have a phone call that I have to make for Okay, um, so 10 minutes from this point. 98 year old father, I'm so sorry. All right. Okay, thanks. Whenever you're ready, we can go back on the record. Do we need to do a roll call? Let's just do a quick one, Dr. McLean. Okay, thanks, Mr. Hurtado. I'm I'm ready. When Dr. You are. Harris, will you call? <clears throat> yes, I will. Uh, Dr. Dion McLean. Present. David Paris. Dr. David Paris, present. Dr. Lawrence Adams. Present. Miss Jeanette Cruz. Present. Dr. Pamela Daniels. Present. Mr. Raphael Sweet. Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you for that, Dr. Paris. And your honor, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Let me just make sure that I've got our next petitioner on the line. Is is it Times or is that yes. how I pronounce it? Yes, Dr. Times, correct. can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, and then um, the documentation I received indicates you're represented by Mr. Corey. Is Mr. Curry here on the line as well? No, Mr. Corey and I spoke this morning and he just indicated to me that he did not feel it was necessary for his presence. He said that he felt that uh, you and the DA and the board members just really wanted to hear from me. So here I am. All right. I will note, Dr. Kimes, I do not see you. I, I can hear you, but are you able to turn your video on? Uh, yes. I, sorry, I'm new to this uh, Zoom. I use this one's new. <laughs> there we go. Absolutely. Can you see me now? Yes, now you're there. Okay, true. Um, all right. We're not on the record yet. Um, you Were you um, in attendance during the previous petition hearing? I was. Okay, so you saw how this will go. Ms. Haro will present the petition packet and give a brief history. Uh, you'll then have a chance to testify on your own behalf, followed by cross-examination and questioning from Ms. Haro and then each board member. Okay. Any questions about the process? Uh, the only question is uh, if I have anybody that I'd like to call for a witness, is that allowable today? Yes, is that person ready and, and oh, can you marshal them quickly? I'm uh, attending from my clinic and I have uh, several staff here that are currently working in my clinic. And so 
you know, the, what I'd like to do is, so the answer is yes, they're, they're available. I would just need to step away for a moment to get them when that time becomes available. Sure. And how many witnesses are you contemplating? Uh, probably just like two or three. I think it would be very brief. Okay. Um, it, two or three and brief is probably going to be okay. If it gets beyond that, I may, especially if the testimony begins to become redundant, I may uh, put some limits on that. I completely respect that. And but when it's when it's time for you to present your case, I'll leave it to you to decide um, if you'd like to call them first or if you'd like to testify on your own behalf first. I, I'd rather go first, I think, because I know they're out working on the clinic. So, all right. Well, uh, it sounds like you're ready to go on the record. Let me check with Miss Haro. Are you ready to go on the record, Miss Haro? Yes. And Miss Straub, are you back and ready to go on the record? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Then we are on the record in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation brought by Dr. Mark Stephen Kimes being heard before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. This is <coughs> board case number AC 2019-1233 and it is OAH case number 2021-120849. My name is Sean Gavin. I'm the Administrative Law Judge from the OAH presiding over this matter. We have previously established that a quorum of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners exists for this matter. Can I take the appearances of the parties starting with counsel? Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro on behalf of the people. Thank you, Ms. Haro. And Dr. Kimes, you are appearing today by teleconference without the assistance of an attorney. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. All right. Before we went on the record, I explained the process that will follow for today's hearing. Do you have any questions about that, Dr. Kynes, before I turn it over to Ms. Haro? No, sir. All right, then Ms. Haro, you can take it away when you are ready. Thank you. I am Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro, and today I am appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I'm here today to assist in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I'm here to ensure that there is adequate information from which to make a decision. I would first like to mark for identification and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the petition packet with accompanying documents. The petitioner has been provided with a copy of the same set of this exhibit. Exhibit 1 generally consists of the petition for early termination of probation, eight letters of support from petitioner's assistants, a doctor who is also a patient, and other patients. There's a document from the California League of Alternative Service Programs, Inter-Program Referral for Community Service Placement. There's a score report from Ethics and Boundaries Assessment Services. A letter from Dr. David Scheffner regarding the psychiatric evaluation of petitioner dated December 30th, 2019. And for the court reporter, Scheffner is spelled S-H-E-F-N as in Nancy, E-R. There are six certificates of, continue, of completion for continuing education, which includes four hours of ethics. There's a probation status report. Then there's the Board of Chiropractic Examiner's decision and order. A letter which includes the accusation attached to that decision and order. There's the letter to petitioner giving notice of today's hearing and proof of service dated December 29th, 2021. And a second letter to petitioner giving notice of hearing and the login information for today, along with the proof of service dated January 13th, 2022. At this time, I offer this packet into evidence as Exhibit 1. Dr. Kimes, do you object to those documents being used as evidence in your case? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Thank you. I will now provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. On January 18th, 1986, the board issued chiropractic license number DC17504 to petitioner. 
Effective July 11, 2020, petitioner's chiropractic license was revoked, but the revocation was stayed and placed on five years probation with terms and conditions. On October 10, 2019, the board filed accusation number AC 2019-1233 against petitioner. That accusation alleged four causes of disciplinary action, which were for an April 9, 2019 criminal conviction for using force or violence upon the person of another, conduct which has endangered the health, welfare, and safety of the public, conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude, and commission of an act involving moral turpitude. The accusation arose from petitioner's sexual relationship with a minor in 2017, wherein petitioner paid a 17-year-old female $250 to engage in sex acts with him. The board's decision and order placing petitioner on five years probation took effect on July 11, 2020. Petitioner is now petitioning for early termination of his probation. Because the burn is on petitioner, I have no further statements but reserve the right to question petitioner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haro. That takes us then to you, Dr. Kynes. I yes. will swear you in so you can testify. Can you please okay. raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, you can put your hand down if you'd like. As I said at the outset, you have the right to testify on your own behalf, you also have the right to call additional witnesses or to present additional documents as you see fit. Which of those three things would you prefer to do first? Um, testify on my own behalf. All right. So um, because you don't have an attorney, you can just simply explain in your own words what you think the board should know when deciding whether to terminate your probation early. Please okay. keep in mind that the board has reviewed the petition packet so there's no need to go over in great detail everything that is in the packet. But if you'd like to highlight or emphasize certain facts, you may do so when you're ready. Sure, thank you. So first of all, let me thank the board members and um, all parties who are here. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, ask for uh, my early termination and probation. So I think it will be helpful for you to know some things that uh, you probably don't know. Um, so um, I was married for 26 years and um, I'm now a divorced man. Um, and um, in my marriage, uh, uh, unbeknownst to me for several years, there was child abuse occurring uh, at the hand of my wife at the time uh, to my young children. And uh, this was concealed. And when my two of my um, children became old enough to learn about what child abuse is, is in school, they came to me to tell me that they thought they were being abused by their mom. And um, so this resulted in uh, her uh, being arrested, uh, and, and I had to facilitate that arrest uh, and Child Protective Services became involved. And so um, uh, eventually uh, um, custody was, was taken by me. And um, the reason why I feel this background is necessary for you to know is because uh, it was very devastating to me. Um, and uh, the good news is that at this time, uh, my children are grown adults and they're healthy and um, they are have gone through extensive therapy as well as myself to navigate that difficult situation. So um, um, emerging from that relationship and that uh, separation and divorce proceedings, uh, I eventually became interested in dating. Um, after a period of time had gone by. And so um, at, uh, some of my friends and family had encouraged me uh, to 
look at going online um, for dating, and this is something that's completely new to me, I'll be quite honest, uh, and um, I'd never done anything or even considered it, but I was interested, and they said it was a kind of a normal way for people to get to know each other. So um, I um, looked at some different websites and eventually met uh, the individual uh, that this um, um, circumstance arose with. And so what happened was um, she responded uh, online uh, and indicated that she had interest in getting to know me and potentially dating me. Well, on the website, uh, there's a profile that indicates, you know, it has a couple of photos of the individual and um, additionally, just her interests and things like that, of that nature. And um, so in her profile, in writing online, it indicated that her age was 22. So we ended up uh, getting involved in conversations that uh, turned into cell phone calls and FaceTime calls. And we eventually, or I should say that we developed a liking towards each other. And there was a definite fondness. And to be quite frank, I was craving uh, some affection and just female presence in my life that I hadn't experienced and I was ready for that. So anyway, um, after a couple, about two and a half months of uh, conversations and FaceTime calls, we arranged for a date. And so uh, I drove to her city and we um, had a wonderful dinner at a Thai restaurant and um, just continuing had to have great conversation. And then we, um, uh, after that, uh, we went to my hotel room and we had uh, consensual sex together. And I, I should also mention that in our phone calls uh, that we had getting to know each other, one of my questions to her was um, that, uh, I was interested to know and confirm that she was 22 and she was very poised, very mature, very articulate. She indicated to me that she was attending college and that she was taking business courses and that she eventually wanted to pursue a business and in career in business administration or something of that nature. So um, one of my questions to her was why somebody who was 22 wanted to date somebody who was in their 50s. And so um, she said that she had not had good experiences with men her own age. She found them to be very immature and that they could not carry on conversations that were interesting to her. And they were not interested in having dates that she felt were fun and to her liking. So, I believe this, I had no reason to not believe it. Um, and so I had verification, or I, I felt I had verification of her age um, on her profile in writing, and I felt that it was reconfirmed in our many conversations. So I just wanted to mention that because that's eventually what led to my interest in having a date with her. So we had a very nice date. It involved one-time consensual sex. Uh, and, um, and then we continued to communicate after that for about a month. And then we just sort of fell off communicating uh, and did not communicate anymore. I do want to mention that, um, that it became, I became aware after, well, well, I guess, let me back up. I'm trying to keep things chronological for you. So um, I need to back up and say that um, in the process of this uh, and after um, 
not having communication with her anymore. I just felt, well, maybe we're not interested in each other anymore or whatever. So then about a year went by and I was contacted by law enforcement uh, in the town of Lamore, which is where she lived in. Um, and it was indicated to me that she was a few days shy of her 18th birthday is what I was told. And so um, I also wanted to mention because of the uh, allegation about there being money received, there was never any conversation, I should say, of money or any exchange of money or anything like that. It was purely uh, us having fondness and a liking towards each other, which moved towards this date. So I should also indicate that, um, so I was obviously um, quite shocked to learn of uh, this a year after. And so um, then I did not know what to do because I, I need to emphasize to the board and to everyone here that I have been a proud law abiding citizen, a proud chiropractor, a proud professional, a continuing educational provider for chiropractors for about 25 years. Uh, I don't break laws. I never intentionally break laws. I am an honorable man. I saw myself through a very difficult situation with my children, which I never dreamed would happen. Um, so I just want to emphasize to you that uh, I have a clean record and I never had any desire whatsoever and still do not and never will have any desire to uh, have any sexual relationships or any relationships for that matter, other than, you know, like family and that sort of thing with anybody under the age of, uh, of 18. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I just wanna emphasize my, my character to you and my good morals and ethics and values and professionalism that have always been manifested in and outside of my practice. So moving forward, uh, I did feel that it was necessary to engage the services of an attorney, Tom Worthington, to represent me on this because I, I really had nowhere, no knowledge of where to go or what to do. So Tom Worthington, uh, my defense counsel uh, um, moved uh, the case forward. And what happened was uh, the, um, the charge uh, that eventually uh, came out of this and that I pled no contest to, or actually I should say that I was charged with was, was um, unlawful sexual conduct with a minor. And so at the time of my plea, and once we went into court, then it was changed to um, uh, simple battery. I believe it's penal code 242, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I pled no contest to simple battery and I was given 100 hours of community service, which I gladly fulfilled. I, as you saw in my document that you have there, I studied ethics and law and, and everything necessary for the ethics and boundary exam. I passed my first time. And so um, I fulfilled all my community service hours, did everything I was uh, put on unsupervised probation uh, as part of this. And after a year of unsupervised probation, um, I um, then uh, it was the case was dismissed and it was entered into um, the record as a not guilty plea. 
And so um, here I am today. Um, and um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should say other than, uh, you know, I have been in my practice working, seeing patients, uh, and part of my order. Oh, I, I need to back up and give you a really important thing. So, Tom Worthington, who was my defense attorney, after getting the dismissal of the case, he said that what I should do is to seek the counsel of a health law attorney. And he said, because he was concerned that I may have reporting requirements to the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. And so we arranged for a meeting between Tom Worthington, my defense counsel, myself, and a Southern California uh, health law attorney that's very well respected. I could give your, I'm happy to give his name if you wish, but I looked into this and he was the one who I was advised was a, a really good choice. Because, and I want to emphasize why I did that, because I wanted to make sure I was compliant with my state board and doing the right thing. So I was advised uh, poorly because on the, in that meeting, um, uh, the council, the health law council, uh, said to me that because the case was dismissed, that I had no obligation to the report to the board, and he said it was not necessary. I followed that, which now I know is bad advice, very bad advice. And so when I was contacted by the board uh, and learned uh, that I needed to respond, then obviously I did not go back to this health law attorney and I hired Mike Corey. And Mike Corey was recommended to me um, uh, by another attorney. And Mike Corey quickly advised that I had gotten very bad advice uh, from the prior attorney and that I should have immediately reported this to the board. So I am very regretful of my bad advice and I'm very regretful that I did not report it to my board. Uh, and um, because now I know that was a horrible mistake. Uh, and I didn't want to call it a mistake. I just got bad advice and I should have reported it to the board. And I even questioned that on the call and it was told I didn't need to. So anyway, here I am now. <laughs> to acknowledge that, uh, that I am remorseful because I should not have, uh, well, I guess what I should not have done is trusted the internet and I should have not trusted this individual. So I should have not trusted what I saw in writing. I should have not trusted the individual. I should have pursued, I guess, documentation. Uh, so, Anyway, um, beyond that, um, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say other than I have continued to teach continuing education courses for chiropractors. I do approximately two to three programs per month, either by Zoom or in person, and I do these uh, throughout California. I do them in the state of Washington, the state of Arizona, and um, I like doing them. And one of my restrictions uh, that I agreed to was to not teach ethics and law, uh, which is one of the things that I normally do teach. And I guess that's ironic. <laughs> um, but uh, I would like to get back to being able to teach ethics and law. And currently I do have defense attorneys that speak on ethics and law on my program, which has been great, but I'd like to share my personal experience <laughs> and be able to help other chiropractors. Uh, Cause I, I feel that, um, that there's this question 
in chiropractors' minds of what they need to report and what they don't need to report. And I very much feel I'm extraordinarily qualified now to answer that question and to really make sure that uh, others know that they need to report. Um, in my own practice, and one of the reasons why I'm asking for the elimination of my probation early is because during COVID, well, first of all, I've always had a very um, busy practice. And during COVID, for the last two years, we have enjoyed our busiest, highest demand ever in my practice. And because of the restrictions on my license, I'm required to and have disclosed to all new patients that I've seen and my regular patients these charges um, and acknowledged their disclosure in writing to them with my staff witnessing it. And when I go see a female patient, I take one of my staff with me every single time to accompany me. And I will tell you that this has slowed down my process in my clinic to the point where I've had to hire one additional staff person because of the demand of our practice, but also because of this additional time consumption of always needing to get somebody before I can see a patient to have them accompany me. And I would very much like to, and, and I also had to hire an additional doctor because of the demand currently and because of the slowing down. And I guess, what would I say? The, um, the encumbrance of the extra layer of time and process, which I have no regrets about. I understand why it was, why I had to do that. Uh, but I have demonstrated and followed all of my probationary requirements with the board. And I feel that, um, that I'm qualified to, if the board agrees, to have my probation terminated early. And I turn it over to you now for your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Kimes. Ms. Faro, any cross-examination? Uh, yes, Dr. Kimes. On your responses to the questions on the petition about yes. continuing education, yes. um, and these are found at uh, the documents marked BCE 4 and 5, and it's questions 5 and 7. Yes. You mentioned that you enclosed documentation for your completion of um, this continuing education courses, and yes. then you enclosed those certificates at the documents marked um, can everyone hear me? I seem to have lost everyone. I can hear you. Dr. Kynes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Judge Gavin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All of a sudden, all of the videos went blank on my screen. All, all right. right. Well, we, we are still here. Okay. Dr. Kimes, the yep. continuing education certificates you included are at BCE 27 and 32. I looked at those and it appears that you are the provider on all of those certificates. Is that correct? Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> so, well, I'm, I'm the one who, it's, it's, it's my courses, in other words, but I teach, I don't teach my entire course. In other words, I have several licensed, approved, uh, well-respected speakers from various chiropractic colleges and different entities within our profession. So uh, those certificates involve me participating in their courses that are on my overall platform. Does that make sense? I think so. Can you describe for us what that platform is? What do yes. you mean by that? Well, what I mean is when a continuing education provider, uh, like I said, I think I've been doing it for nearly 25 years, offers a course, um, I don't teach the entire course. So my portion of the course on, on let's say, if it's a 12 hour one day course, 
my particular participation could be one hour of, of a talk on examination procedures, uh, detailed history taking as an example, uh, or it could be a two hour presentation or a three hour presentation. So the other, the remaining portion to make up that entire 12 hours would be by a doc bar radiologist. It would be by uh, uh, a defense attorney. It could be from uh, a faculty person uh, at uh, one of the chiropractic colleges and their credentials all have to be approved, of course, by the um, Board of Chiropractic Examiners. So does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Okay. On two of those certificates at BCE 27 and BCE 30, they yeah. both include hours for ethics and law. Can you yeah. tell us who taught those portions of those courses? Yes, um, it was Michael Corey, my defense attorney, or Michael Tran, who is not my defense attorney. So um, both of those uh, are, are go-to uh, ethics and law um, lecturers. They both have done a tremendous job for us and uh, we've gotten excellent reviews on their talks. Have you taken any other continuing education courses since the disciplinary action from yes. other providers outside of your platform? I have. So um, I should mention to the board uh, that uh, for 10 years, uh, I was a uh, board of chiropractic, a board of trustee <laughs> regent for Life Chiropractic College West. So um, what that means as a board member for them, I, I'm not currently a voting board member or anything like that, but I, but I was uh, in that uh, my term, my 10 year term came to conclusion a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago or something like that. And so, um, why I'm mentioning that is because I, I'm constantly on campus <laughs> and they host a lot of continuing education events, including one very big one that takes place over two, two to three days called the WAVE. And so as a board member and as a doctor of chiropractic, I've attended many courses, including those outside of my own. I don't have any further questions, so I will turn it over to the board or uh, Dr. Kimes's other witnesses. However, Your Honor would like to proceed. Sure, we'll finish this witness first before we turn to others. <clears throat> Going in order, Dr. McLean, any questions for this petitioner? Um, hi, thank you, Your Honor. Yes, um, Dr. Kimes, Mr. Kimes. Um, thank you being here and I do have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, the Deputy AG spoke to you about the classes that you submitted for continuing education being classes that you are listed as the, the provider even though you're stating you didn't actually teach it because you are the provider of record and these are your courses. Do you feel that there's any conflict there? Um, I don't because uh, in my inquiry to the board uh, and all of my years of being a DC, uh, it was indicated to me, and I believe it's actually in the chiropractic regulations because I did read the entire chiropractic act for the state of California, as well as all of the chiropractic board uh, regulations for chiropractors, it clearly states in there that providers such as myself are a, like, in other words, I get credit for attending or even teaching, I should say, my own course. <laughs> so I don't feel that it was a conflict because if it's not a conflict for the board, I did never saw it as one. And I have to be very engaged in my own subject matter 
uh, to the point where people want to attend and reattend in the future. Um, and uh, so when I inquired with the board uh, over the phone and when I read the Chiropractic Act, it actually allows for that. So I did not see it as being a conflict. Um, however, if it is, I'm, I'm open to doing it another way. And would, so, um, so um, just so we're clear, you're saying yeah. that the board does allow for you to receive credit when you are teaching um, a course, that is correct. However, when you're on probation, my question simply was just um, either an appearance of conflict or conflict when you're on probation and you're taking a course from providers whom could just as easily just sign off on a sheet for you. Um, you. Uh, gives an appearance if it's not an, an actual conflict. And that was my question. I see. Okay. Um, and so moving on, yes. um, you've been a continuing ed provider for many years, you're stating. Uh -huh. And throughout that time, you have, as previously testified, um, provided ethics and law um, lectures, as well as had others under your supervision provide those lectures. And my question is, given that information, you still um, stand by your testimony here, as I interpreted, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were not aware that you should have reported or, or communicated these, this conviction to the board? That's correct. Um, I went to the time and the expense of seeking legal counsel um, to obtain advice uh, to make sure that I was acting properly. And I will tell you that based upon that advice and getting assured that I was not necessarily that it was not necessary for me to report. I did not. I fully realize now <laughs> because uh, having been represented by a new attorney, Michael Corey, through this process, he advised me that, and I now know, I mean, that any law enforcement issue, and, and I will say I haven't had any, but, and I don't anticipate any in the future. Uh, but if I ever was to have any in the future, I would immediately report it. I recently had a speeding violation and I was on the phone and called Michael Corey to say, do I, you know, because I, I guess I should say, I sort of feel extraordinarily acutely aware <laughs> that I have this reporting requirement now. And okay. it's, no, it's no laughing matter for me at all. And, and I, but he said I did not need to report that. Speaking okay. Of Sorry. Okay. Um, so um, given your history as a continuing education provider yeah. um, and you are, are supervising uh, a lot of information that is put forth to the public and to other doctors, yeah. do you feel that it is your responsibility to keep abreast of, of, of the requirements of the board or new laws or new regs and that sort of thing that occur? I do, for sure, and okay. this is why I have read <laughs> the Chiropractic Act and the regulations and will always keep abreast, and I am, I feel now because of my experience, I have a unique opportunity to. But did you not, did you not feel that same way prior to this conviction and this no, reprimand? I, I, I've always felt that way. I, I've always felt that way. I've always been a very reputable ethical professional, but I should have known that on my own that I should have reported it and and I didn't and I regret that and now I do 
and I should have dug into that more deeply. Um, but I felt the best that I could do would to be get legal counsel because I'm, I assumed that legal counsel would know and advise me correctly. Okay. Um, also, um, do you currently, and, and if you can just give me a brief yes or no answer, yes. yeah. do you currently um, check the board's website or subscribe to the newsletter? I don't subscribe to the newsletter, but I do look at the board website uh, and have even watched videos of board proceedings just because I, I, I find it very interesting and uh, a lot of chiropractors do look up to me and I do have a lot of responsibilities within the profession that I take very seriously and will always continue to take seriously. So yes, I am very involved in staying active with keeping myself current and will continue to do so out of my personal responsibility for not only myself, but my practice, my patients, the community, and also the chiropractic profession. Okay, thank you. Um, just briefly also, did, uh, and, and again, if you can just be brief. Um, prior to this discipline action, did you frequently check the board's website um, at, at any, you know, regular frequency prior to this? The answer is yes, um, not to the extent that I do now, but I, I do because I'm a, a, a continuing education provider. And um, so uh, I think that there was a level of participation before and a level of participation after. And I now have, like I said before, an acute awareness that <laughs> makes me um, even more vigilant, if you will. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. McLean. Dr. Paris, any questions for the petitioner? Uh, my questions were asked. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Adams? Uh, yes, I have a I have a couple of questions. Good morning, Dr. Kimes. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for your uh, appearance here today. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, what what college did uh, the um, individual that you um, had this uh, relationship with? What college did she claim to be attending? She claimed to be attending a community college uh, in her uh, area. And I don't recall the name of the community college. Um, and you just reminded me of something. Um, and that is that um, it was, I was made aware that apparently um, she dated some other men as well uh, that were older than her. And apparently what had happened was, uh, this is what I was told, um, once law enforcement started talking to my defense attorney and all of that, was that um, apparently she enjoyed our day. And so she shared it with a girlfriend. And she also shared with her girlfriend that there was a couple of other men or maybe more that she had dated uh, and had enjoyed the encounter. Well, her friend that um, uh, knew that she was not quite 18 yet reported it. And that's how I ended up here. I just thought I'd throw in that other fact. But to answer your question, I do not recall the name of the community college that she attended, but I do remember distinctly that she said it was a community college. So in other words, it wasn't a university or something like that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yes. And I, I was looking for it. I, you know, I read these uh, documents over the last yes. few days and was trying to go back. Did I read in there that that you had solicited 
um, prior? Did you, in your conversations with the, the psychiatric MD that did your evaluation that you had solicited prior? Um, was it in your 20s or was um, a sexual encounter with a, um, a prostitute in Mexico? Is that, did I read that wrong? I think you read that wrong. I have never solicited any prostitution no. ever with anyone. I, okay. I, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that for some reason. I, well, I'm, I'm glad that, you did. And that you had said that, and that you had said that, that they were in their twenties. So I, I was told by this particular individual that she was 22 verbally. And I also had it in writing on the pro on her profile. So I'm glad you asked that question because if any other board members have any question about me ever soliciting prostitution, the answer is absolutely no. Never have, never will, doesn't interest me at all. And I just want to emphasize my law abiding professional ethical nature in and outside of my practice. This was a very unfortunate, uh, regrettable one time incident that I never had any intention of being involved with anybody underage ever. Thank you. You're so just a couple, just a couple of clarifications here. So we don't have the advantage or of, of hearing the other side. Yes. And as your, um, as your uh, uh, evaluator, your psychiatric evaluator pointed out, you know, uh, we're in kind of a he said, she said situation. So we're really only having the advantage of hearing your side of it. But yes. he makes the statement here that, um, um, you know, that, you know, he has to, he's leaving it to the triers of fact, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and not a physician to make the opinion, but he takes the worst case scenario that, that he accepts this individual case claims that you made a financial arrangement prior to. Is it your testimony still that that was never, that, that, that there was no prior arrangement made that the money that you paid to her was because after, after engaging in sexual activity, she gave you kind of a story about her financial circumstances and you gave her $200 after the fact? That's, that's correct. There was never any solicitation at all, ever. Uh, but I will and should bring up that apparently, and, and again, I don't know any more than you do, but what I was told was that uh, she had some encounters with these other individual men and that there may have been different circumstances in, in theirs than in mine. I had a true fondness of this individual uh, and there was never, ever any discussion of exchanging anything monetarily or otherwise, other than just going and having a nice date and having a good time. That's it. Thank you. So her her statement that you picked her up at a Dairy Queen is blatantly false that you met at a Thai restaurant. Is that correct? We 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 met at a location that this is what she told me. She told me that she lived with her grandmother uh, and that her grandmother was providing, you know, basically uh, her um, uh, her housing and her basic needs. And so she asked me to pick her up near the Thai restaurant because she didn't know where it was and she didn't want to have to introduce me to her grandmother. Was that a red flag? It wasn't. I mean, I, I look at, I, I'm just going to let everybody on the board know one of my faults is I'm an overly trusting individual. And especially in this circumstance where I had multiple conversations, FaceTimes, all the things that I testified to, I never, it should have, it should have been a red flag. And I should have questioned it and 
Very unfortunately for me, I did not. I mean, this is so, kind of, just know. in conclusion, is it is it fair to say because you admitted to your therapist that you had an expectation of sexual activity upon going down there um, that perhaps that clouded your judgment a little bit or a lot? Well, it, it, it may have. And, and I'm going to be very frank and very open with the board. Her and I, uh, in our phone calls and over the course of FaceTimes, you know, there, there was an attraction there. And, and uh, you know, she expressed a desire to have, uh, you know, intimacy with me. Uh, we never discussed of what level, but, you know, it was something that we were both clearly looking forward to and that that desire for intimacy developed over the course of these two and a half months that we were in conversation with each other. Did you ask her for identification? I did not. I should have. And I, that was, I... <laughs> Should have, and I did not, and that was a, a very unfortunate. But I, I just want to emphasize to you that I trusted her, and I trusted what she told me as being the truth that she was 22. I trusted what it said on her profile, and um, it never, even remotely, crossed my mind that she was under 18. She was tall, well-dressed, sophisticated, articulate, poised, very mature. Uh, when we talked about her desire to date older men, she was very clear on why she was attracted to older men. And um, so. Thank you. So one welcome. final question. So yes. at the time of your um, agreement to your stipulation, um, the five-year probation was acceptable. Yes. Um, what is your primary reason for early um, termination? My primary Just the encumbrances, the encumbrances that it's placing on you as a practitioner. Well, I've always enjoyed, prior to this event, the ability to serve uh, unencumbered and to be able to really take care of my community. I'm very well respected, very well reviewed uh, in Monterey County and in Salinas. And this has made it difficult for me to practice at my normal capacity. And so I would like to return to my normal capacity um, because I feel that uh, I have learned tremendously from this and I feel that I can be a better service to my community, my practice, my staff, and my profession by being able to not have, having the time, staff involvement in this process. And I think my circumstances speak for themselves and, and I am re rehabilitated, if you will, in terms of uh, I look at my um, self-professed, overly trusting nature as being behind me now. <laughs> and I look at things very differently as a result of this. And I want to uphold my professional standards within my practice uh, and you. Serve, serve my community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Dr. Adams. That takes us then to Dr. Daniels. I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right, Ms. Cruz. I have a question. Um, you mentioned before that you were on a board of the Life Chiropractic College of West. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, with um, kind of given the timing, you didn't. You mentioned it was a couple years ago. Were you a board member kind of at the time or and after? Uh, kind of after you had to report the incident to the board? I was, I'd have to look at that time frame, but I believe my tenure term had expired. When oh, started. at that time. No, again, again, my question was going to lead to if they were aware of, and you were, if you were still sitting on the board, since that's not the case. Thank you. 
Thank you. No questions. All right, and then finally, Mr. Sweet. Yeah, just a couple couple items. Um, thank you for your time, um, Dr. Kimes. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to address something I think Dr. Adams was asking about previously. Okay. And uh, Dr. Schechner's report, I think, indicated on the BCE 18, he indicated that when he asked you about it, that there was a previous incident with a prostitute. And I think that's where um, Dr. Adams's question about that previous incident came from. Um, so maybe if you didn't say it, maybe it was in, it's in Dr. Schuffner's report. So I just thought I would clarify that. But uh, my, my other question was just um, regarding, I know one of the reasons you said you wanted to um, stop the probation, terminate the probation is because you have had this practice of bringing staff members when you're treating female patients. Is that correct? Yes. So what that means is it, it just involves me uh, finding an available staff person, bringing them in, uh, and which, look, I'm, I, I, I want you to know I'm, I was more than happy to comply and still am with all the terms of my probation. It's just that it's a, it, it, it create it, it, it has caused me to have to hire another DC to keep up with the demand of our practice, and it's caused me to hire an additional staff person as well. So uh, it's created a financial burden. Uh, it's created a time burden constraint also on my ability to serve my patient base, uh, which uh, there's absolutely zero threat uh, inside or outside of my practice of me to the public or to my patients. So I just wanna reemphasize that. I, 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 sorry for interrupting. No, that, I think that addresses what I was going to ask. And so that's a, a practice that you're hoping to discontinue as soon as the probation is terminated. That's that's exactly right. And then it, it it is also the process of, and I should mention that on every new patient that I see, uh, of course, I disclose uh, verbally and in writing, and with one of my staff witnessing it. And again, I've. I've been compliant with that all throughout this process, and and um, and I understand why that was necessary. But uh, I would I would prefer to be able to, since I'm not a threat at all, uh, to be able to no longer have that um, have to do that. Understood. That. No further questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, that then concludes the questions for you, Dr. Judge Kim. Gavin. Judge, I, excuse me. Um, yeah, Judge Gavin. Gavin. Yes. I'm sorry, um, Madam Chair. I just, I just had one follow-up question. That, okay, uh, hold on Sweet one second. Um, after, he, after Dr. Adams, um, Judge, Dr. Paris also has one follow-up question, and then we'll move on from there. Thank you. Very good. Go ahead, Dr. Adams. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Kime, just to follow up, I appreciate Dr. Sweat. You know, that um, one of those things sometimes when you're looking for something, it doesn't jump out at you. Um, so, yes, on BCE uh, page 18, uh, Dr. Schechner points out upon specific inquiry, he states that he had gone to a prostitute previously on one occasion in Mexico prior to his marriage, stating that the woman was in her 20s. Is that is that a false statement then? I don't think it's true because I don't remember ever having any encounter. Dr. Scheffner did ask me a lot of questions, hundreds uh, in writing and verbally, and I have not had any uh, encounters of prostitution. So. He asked me a lot of questions about prostitution. Uh, I may have mentioned, because I have traveled to Mexico uh, frequently, uh, especially when I was younger <laughs> and before I was married. And uh, so, but I, it, there was never a prostitution. And I, I, I know on one occasion, I did date someone in her 20s that I had met in Mexico, but there was no prostitution involved. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Hi, Dr. I, Times. I Thank have, you. I have no further questions. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Parents. Hi, Dr. Kimes. Thank you uh, for being here today. Sure. Um, I just was hoping you might clarify for me because I, my long memory isn't always so great. So I, I okay. want to make sure I have this accurately. Um, at some point in like 02, 03, maybe even 01, so it's been a little while, the Journal of the California Chiropractic Association ran an ad and um, it was famously used by Jackie Spear in a legislative hearing, but it said something to the effect of the only golden goose that is really st still laying the golden eggs is yeah. workers' compensation and incentivizing uh, DCs to, um, you know, make make money in, in the golden goose, which was yes. work comp. Yes. And my recollection was, uh, A, I want to make sure, was that your advertisement? That was my advertisement, yes. Okay. And I had a... Uh, uh, I guess a person. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on, Dr. Pence. It, it, um, Dr. Paris just asked a yes or no. Was that your ad? So you've answered that question. Yes. Let's wait for a new question. Sure. And then, and then the reason I just want to clarify that is mm -hmm. my recollection, and please correct me. Um, was there an advertising complaint submitted to the board? Um, I don't. I think there was. Uh, okay. I don't recall that there ever was. No. Um, okay. I, I used a marketing consultant guy to help me write ads. And so I placed that ad. And so, yeah. Okay. I'll take your word on that. That was a long time ago. I, I My recollection was that there was, but I will, I accept your, your statement that uh, if yeah. you don't recall I, it. I do yeah. not ever recall it. Thank you. Having, yes. Thank you. All right, uh, any other questions from board members? Seeing none, uh, let me ask our court reporter before I open it up to Dr. Kimes for any additional witnesses. Do you need a break, Ms. Raub? She's indicated with her body I'm language. She a break, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Dr. Times, um, do you have additional witnesses you want to call? Yes, please. All right. Um, I'm going to have you do that. I am going to limit the um, scope of their testimony to be about any rehabilitation, not about any of the underlying acts that led to the discipline, but any rehabilitation since the license discipline. Uh, can you just either repeat that or clarify what that is? I, I'm sorry. I'm just not. Yes. Yeah, so, so in in a petition hearing. Yes. The the um, relevant question is whether there is adequate evidence to support the relief requested. In your case, that is to terminate the term of probation early. Yes. So, any evidence related to the underlying conduct that led to the license discipline would be not relevant to the hearing I, because I the hearing is focused solely on any rehabilitative efforts since I, the license discipline. Okay. So with that in mind, um, you can call your next witness. Can you tell okay. me the name of that person? Uh, I have to step out and see who's available, but it will probably be Amy, A-M-Y, Mirasol, M-I-R-A-S-O-L. Okay, you can take a moment and call Ms. Mirasol into the room. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, you're speaking. Uh, so this is Amy Marisol, who I had indicated previously. So Amy, maybe you can just give a little background about. Well, um, hang, hang on, I have to swear her in as a witness. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, good morning, ma'am. Uh, my name is Sean Gavin. I'm the administrative law judge presiding over this case. The okay. way this will work is after I swear you in, I will invite Dr. Kimes to ask you questions and then you'll answer his questions. And then I will give the deputy attorney general and the various board members an opportunity to ask questions if they have any as well. Okay, great, thank you. So what I'll have you do is raise your right hand so I can swear you in. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. All right, you can put your hand down if you'd like. Can okay. I have you state and spell your name for the record, please? Sure, it's Amy, and that's A-M-Y. Last name, M-I-R-A-S-O-L. All right, thank you. Dr. Kimes, you'll have to ask Ms. Mirasol questions. You may proceed when you're ready. Thank you. So Amy, can you describe um, how long uh, you've been working here uh, at my clinic? Yes. And at the same time, um, uh, well, so, and, and, and if you feel uh, that my uh, continued probation is necessary, okay or if you feel that it would be warranted or justified to have it terminated early. Okay, okay. So you all know I've been with Dr. Kynes over 26 years, going on 27. And throughout all these years, um, again, Dr. Kimes has always conducted himself in a professional manner, not only with us staff, but also with our patients. And, um, you know, because of his professionalism, we do have many patients who do prefer to be adjusted by Dr. Kimes only because we do have other doctors in our office. So with that being said, you know, I do feel that the probation that he's on should be terminated. And again, and that's in my opinion. Thank you. Um, based upon his professionalism, based upon, um, you know, his work ethics with here in the office and as far as you know the role that he plays in our office is really important and you know again with dealing with the public and patients and whatnot it's always been in a professional manner yeah and again in the 26 years like i mentioned he's always been very professional and have we traveled together to uh seminars outside the practice um have you had experiences with me outside the practice as well in the public? And how would you view my conduct outside of the practice as well? Yes. So yes, again, Your Honor, we do um, have trainings where we do travel outside of the office. We also do have um, family gatherings with Dr. Kimes where our families, you know, will, um, ha you know, visit with Dr. Kimes. And so outside of the office, we also, have communication with him and whatnot. And during all those times, again, they're always very professional. Um, he's very generous, um, you know, not only to us, for our families as well. It's always been, you know, again, very professional and, um, you know, yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any other questions for uh, Amy. Okay. Um, Dr. Kimes, any further questions for this witness? No, sir. All right. Ms. Harlow, any questions for this witness? Yes. Uh, Ms. Marisol, uh, I'm the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, what's your understanding of the reason Dr. Kimes' license was disciplined? Well, again, you know, my understanding was, first of all, there was a misunderstanding with him as far as the actual age of this person so again you know that's that's what my understanding is and there's that discrepancy as far as what age she had mentioned she was and what she actually was all right and you said you've worked with dr kimes for 20 years or more correct so 26 plus years almost 27. <laughs> thank you how has dr kimes's practice changed from since he was put on probation 
um, you know, again, he still sees patients. However, his role in our office changed even beforehand, maybe like about six to eight years ago, where he's now um, clinic director, which means, of course, he's not um, seeing uh, patients at, he's still seeing patients, but not as actively as before, but he's more behind the scenes, you know, making sure reports are done correctly, whether there's certain recommendations that needs to be done, he will have the, um, the authorization, you know, we get his authorization. Also, we deal a lot with attorneys. So in order for me to negotiate a lien, I do need to get his authorization. So that's kind of the role that he's played but he is present weekly because we do have staff meetings and that's where his role as clinic director really takes place. Approximately how many patients does Dr. Kime see a week? Um, gosh, per week, it could be anywhere from maybe four to eight. It just really depends on patients, whether they could come in or not. And approximately how many patients did he see per week before he was put on probation? Oh gosh, that's kind of tough to say. Um, again, it would vary per week, probably anywhere from 300 to 450 up maybe. A week? Yes, we, we are very high volume office here. For the All right. I, yeah, yeah. Before. That, that goes way back. And Mr. Dr. Kimes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, that was way back, but when I, his, I can't hear what Dr. Kimes is saying. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Kimes, um, while um, Ms. Haro is questioning the witness, you're not necessarily audible. So oh, I, yeah. your, your comment was lost on the record. Um, but also, I'm not going to have you repeat it because it's not appropriate for you to, to question the witness right now. Okay. Uh, Ms. Haro, you can continue with your questioning. Uh, Ms. Mirasol, would you like to clarify or explain what you meant by uh, the number of patients yes. Dr. Kimes <laughs> saw per week prior to probation? Yes, yes, and I apologize. So again, yes, that was quite some time ago. Um, it was a while back um, before his role changed. That's how many patients he would approximately see, anywhere from three to three, three to four hundred. A week. Okay, and that was prior to him moving into this role as a clinic director? That is correct. All right. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Okay. All right, then we're going to see if our board members have any questions. I will start with you, Dr. McLean. I have no questions. Thank you. Dr. Paris? Hello, I have one quick question. Um, so, generally with high volume uh, offices, mm -hmm. there there a lot of times there will also be some uh, preceptors or interns sure. um, or students. Do you, do you have those in your office from time to time? Um, oh gosh, we have not for quite some time. You know, again, we may have had one or two maybe years ago, but this is, was again early on with me starting with Dr. Kimes. Okay, and uh, I have one other question. So if if a, uh, a female patient that Dr. Kimes might see in the office, can you tell me how the procedures um, might change or be different than they are for uh, the other chiropractors that you have working? Of course, in? are you talking about now? What's correct? Yeah. Yes, I'm yes. talking about now. So with every female um, patient, they are accompanied by one of us CAs. Um, and that is through the whole duration of their visit, their adjustment. So yes, he is definitely accompanied. And he does, before he goes in, he does um, request one of us girls to accompany him. So he, you know, again, we're, we're following that protocol. Thank you, I have no further okay. questions. Okay. All right, thank you. Dr. Adams, any questions? Yes, um, Amy, thank you for your time. Sure. Did you say did you say that Dr. Kimes currently sees between four and eight patients per uh, week or per day? Yeah, I'm sorry, that would be a week. Again, that's approximately and oftentimes, you know, we all have different types that we have um, sorry, varying lunches. So there may be, you know, patients who come in that I'm not aware of, but again, there's always a staff here 
during, you know, Dr. Kimes adjustment with the patient. And so out of that four to eight visits per week, how many of those are females? I would probably, well, I know there's one male. I would probably say um, one male for sure, and the rest are females. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions, Dr. Adams? I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, I, I, I apologize. I have no further questions. Thank you. Not to worry. All right, Dr. Daniels. I have no questions. Thank you. Ms. Cruz. No questions. And Mr. Sweet. Just one quick question, um, Ms. Mirasol. Um, in the uh, before this um, probation was was put in place, was there ever any concern expressed by? you or other female staff members or any female patients um, regarding Dr. Kimes during his time at the, at the None office. at all. I'm sorry? None at all, sorry. That's all I have. Okay. All right, any other questions from any board members? All right, seeing and hearing none, thank you for your time and testimony today. Ms. Marisol, you are released as a witness. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kimes, are there any other witnesses you wish to call? Yes, please, um, Sandra Tenahero. All right, you can take a moment and go get that witness. Oh, here she is. Hi, right, good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Gavin. I'm the Administrative Law Judge presiding over this matter. The way this will work is in a moment, I'll swear you in as a witness. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Kimes to ask you questions he might have of you. I'll then give the Deputy Attorney General and board members a chance to ask you any questions. Okay. So can I have you raise your right hand so I can swear you in? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, you can put your hand down if you'd like. Can you state and spell your name for the record, please? Uh, sure, my name is Sandra Tinajero. It's spelled S A N D R A. Last name is T as in Tom, I N as in Nancy, A J E R O. All right, Dr. Kimes, when you are ready, you may question the witness. Okay. Um, so, Sandra, um, can you give a brief background of uh, your relationship with me. Okay. Well, um, I have been working for Dr. Times for um, 19 years. And through my whole entire time of employment, um, I mean, Dr. Times has always been um, really professional um, with me. He takes care of me along with the rest of my family. They come and they get adjusted. He's always been very professional with all the staff members along with all of his patients. Um, so, Sandra, um, one of the things I want to ask you is, do you feel that uh, my behavior towards men and women in the practice uh, over the course of how many years? 19 years. 19 years. Have you, how have you viewed my conduct? Is it safe? Do the patients feel I'm acting appropriately? Have you ever witnessed me or heard of any comment ever being made from any patient or any person in or outside of this office about my conduct other than being purely professional, ethical, and straightforward? Yeah, so again, you know, I've been here for 19 years. Dr. Kahn has never behaved in a certain way or his again his conduct has always been very professional again you know we have many patients that he used to see many many years ago but again always very professional i mean i'm comfortable enough to where you know my whole entire family treats here my parents come in here a lot of family members come from you know uh young adults to you know children to all ages and always been super comfortable with dr Kimes adjusting my entire family and again very professional with everyone in the office um, from staff to all the patients he's ever 
ever seen. Again, we're a very high volume office. Well, I guess I do have one quick one. So do you feel that uh, it would be appropriate for my prohibition to be terminated early with absolutely no concerns over uh, my my safety to the public or practice in or outside of the office? Yes. Should it be yes or Yes. Thank you. Okay, I have nothing further. All right, Ms. Haro, any questions for this witness? <laughs> Yes. Uh, can you tell us what your understanding is for the reason Dr. Kimes' license was disciplined? Um, so my understanding was um, that there was a misunderstanding or a discrepancy on the age from what was being told to him to what the actual person's age was. Um, yeah, that's how they know. Thank you. Can you tell us how Dr. Kimes' practice has changed since he was placed on probation? Um, I mean, it hasn't changed. Um, I feel like the practice still runs as is just because, again, Dr. Kimes' role had already changed um, years back to the probation being in place. Um, his role went from being the main doctor to a clinic director, meaning that he's still in the office, but he's not treating all the patients that he used to treat. He's more kind of behind the scenes. He's present, but it's more like, you know, kind of looking over everything that's still going on in the office, but without really seeing the patients that he used to see many years ago. Thank you. No further questions. All right, let's turn to the board then. Dr. McLean, any questions for this witness? No, I have no questions, Your Honor. Dr. Paris? No questions, thank you. Dr. Adams? No questions, thank you. Dr. Daniels? No questions, thank you. Ms. Cruz? No questions. Mr. Sweet? I don't have any questions. All right. Final call for any board questions. Hearing none, thank you for your time and testimony. Ms. Tenehero, you are excused as a witness. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, So I have one final person to call. Um, All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Gavin. I'm the administrative law judge assigned to hear this case or to preside over this case, I should say. Um, in a moment, I'll swear you in as a witness. I'll then uh, give Dr. Kimes a chance to ask you any questions, followed by questions from the Deputy Attorney General and members of the board. So what I'd like to do first is have you raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury? That the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. All right, you can put your hand down if you'd like. Can I have you state and spell your name for the record, please? Um, my name is Karina Montanez. Um, first name K A R I N A, last name Amazon Mary O N T A N E Z. All right, thank you, Ms. Montanez. Dr. Kimes, you may begin when you are ready. Yes, so Karina, would you please um, let the board know um, how long uh, you've been here uh, at the clinic and um, maybe just tell them your age and what your role's been. Yes, so I have been working with Dr. Kynes for two years now. Um, I am 26 years old. So from when I started working, I was working obviously in the office, but also was hired to travel um, due to being a monitor for the CE from Dr. Kimes all throughout California. So from the first week that I was hired, I was traveling with him and um, I was always super comfortable traveling, traveling with him um, as well as in the office. And I honestly really like my job for that. Okay, um, 
So next question, um, do you feel that I am any threat to anybody in or outside of the practice in all of your experiences with me? Or do you feel that the public in and outside the practice, the staff, um, my patients are in good hands, that there, has there ever been anything inappropriate? Have I been professional? Uh, have I been honest, direct, open, kind? Give that, yeah. please. So I feel like Dr. Clance has often been very professional in our office, outside of the office. We've had many, you know, office dinners, lunches, but we also travel all together. And me specifically along with him, like I mentioned earlier, he's always been super professional with everybody around him. I feel very comfortable with him in the office. My sister traveled, um, she's in the military, traveled here to visit, and I even had her come in to get taken care of here in the office because I feel so comfortable um, with, you know, Dr. Kynes and the way he carries himself. So I honestly don't feel like he's any threat to anybody in or outside of the office uh, from what I've experienced with him these past few years. Okay, my last question is, um, did I coach you, tell you what to say, talk to you before this, other than just ask your permission to participate or anybody else? You no, know, um, when I walked in this morning to set up the computer for you, you just asked me if I was okay with, if I was called to be a witness, and I said yes, and that's the last time we spoke. I have nothing further. All right, thank you. Ms. Haro, any questions? Thank you, Ms. Montanez. I missed, how long have you been an assistant for Dr. Kites? Two years. Two years. Yes. Were you working with him uh, prior to his license being on probation? Yes. Okay. What's your understanding of why his license was placed on probation? My understanding is that he uh, was dating somebody who was not honest about her age or what he was told her age was and what it actually was. So I that's why his license is on probation. And uh, have there been any changes that you've seen in Dr. Kimes's practice from the time uh, his license was put on probation? Um, not really, because when I started working here, he was more of a clinic director and he was still seeing patients like he is now, but honestly, it hasn't really changed since I've been here the past two years. Thank you, no further questions. All right, that takes us to the board. Dr. McLean, any questions? I have none for this witness, thanks. Dr. Paris? No questions. Dr. Adams? I have no questions. Dr. Daniels? No, thank you. Ms. Cruz? No questions. Mr. Sweet? No questions, thank you. All right, that concludes this witness then. Thank you for your time and testimony, ma'am. You are free to go and release as a witness. Thank you. Am I able to ask for an additional question or not? Pardon me, yes. If you have another question, you may ask it. I do. So, um, Karina, when I explained to you and to the other staff about what happened and what resulted in my probation, did I clearly explain to you that um, and, and, and give you a lot of detail about exactly the fact that I was charged with unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor and um, give you an opportunity to ask any questions about the charges? Did I talk to you about what my probation requirements were? So it's really just kind of like a yes or no. Did I, was I clear about why and how I, it came for me to have uh, probation? Yes. Okay. And, um, did I also answer your questions, any patient's questions where it was disclosed to them because it was disclosed to you in writing? 
it was disclosed to you verbally. Uh, and those documents that explained what was going on were prepared by Michael Corey. So they're very clear, they're very explicit about how and why my license is placed on probation. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, was I very forthright to you, the other staff, to all my patients? And is it your understanding uh, that I have followed explicitly all of the terms for my probation? Yes. I have nothing further. All right, I'll give a final chance for any board members who have questions speak now. All right, hearing none, thank you, Ms. Montanez. You are released as a witness. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Kimes, uh, any other evidence you'd like to offer on your own behalf? You know, I just really uh, want to say thank you. Uh, for this opportunity. I realize the board's very busy. I realize you have big things in front of you and I've been very involved in chiropractic and politically uh, for many years. I, uh, and, um, you know, I, I'd like to put this behind me and I regret what happened and um, I just appreciate um, what the board does and uh, how you serve our profession. And I thank you for your consideration of me in this matter. All right, thank you, Dr. Kimes. That that was uh, maybe in the nature of closing argument. So um, let me just ask, is that, would you like to use that as your closing argument? Well, I think, I think my closing argument is that um, this has been a very costly and difficult situation for me. Um, I have spent, <laughs> Uh, money to pay for the administration of this for the board, over $4,000. I have paid attorney's fees, probably getting close to thirty or $40,000. Um, I've had to hire additional staff, an additional doctor. Uh, it's been a great cost to me. And, uh, and I understand and I acknowledge uh, the incident and I regret that I did was not more vigilant, uh, and um, and I really regret that uh, I did not report this to the board. Uh, and I can assure you that I will always conduct myself with the utmost legal, moral, ethical standards um, as a citizen and as a chiropractor. Uh, that the board can feel good about now and in the future. That's my closing statement. Thank you, Dr. Times. Ms. Harrow, any closing remarks? No closing, thank you. All right, then in a moment, I'm, I'm going to ask whether the matter is submitted. Um, and by that, I mean, are you satisfied you've had a full opportunity to present all evidence and make all argument on your behalf? Before I do that, let me just ask briefly about um, the psychiatric evaluation, yes. Ms. Haro, typically those would be filed under seal. The object, if I issue a protective order for pages 17 through 25 of the petition packet. No objection. Dr. Condoms, do you object if I, if I seal those pages so they're not available for public view, specifically just the psych evaluation? I appreciate that, Your Honor, and I... Thank you for that. All right, that portion of the record will be sealed. Uh, and as I said, um, is the matter submitted, Dr. Times? Yes, Your Honor. And thank you again, board members and everyone involved. Ms. Haro, is the matter submitted? Submitted. All right, then this matter is submitted. The case is closed and we are off the record. I need to check in with our court reporter and see if she needs any words or names spelled. If you could spell his attorney's name, that would be helpful. It's K-H-O-U-R-I. Michael. I think I lip read what's his first name. Michael Corey, yes. Okay. Nothing else in this room? Not that I can think of, thank you. All right. 
Um, can I have your time of completion and estimated number of pages? I didn't hear you, Ms. Trout. I'm sorry, I was saying one minute, I was looking at the pages. Um, time of completion is 1218 and approximately 75 pages. And you didn't ask me that for the first day, so I don't know if you want that now or. I do, I do, yeah, I, I wanted you to get to your phone call, which seemed urgent, but yeah, I do need that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the time of completion was 1028 and the same 75 pages. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Um, it's it's twelve eighteen. I will leave it up to you. I, I'm happy to to push through without a lunch break. If you prefer to have a lunch break, um, it's it's your meeting, so I'll I'll leave it to your good judgment about how to proceed here. Uh, we'd like to push through, okay. and then have our our break after. Okay, we might need to give Miss Stroud just a brief break for her fingers. Then, Your Honor, I'm not Stroud. comfortable asking for a break. So you guys do what you want to do. Okay. Whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, um, Dr. McLean, do you do you want to have a break or do you want to go straight to the final hearing? Uh, I'd like to go straight to the final hearing if that's okay. All right. Then that's what Madam we'll do. Chair. Yes. Madam Chair, with all due respect, it, I, I would like at least a, a five minute break to go to the restroom and uh, get some water. I don't know if any other board members need a little break, but I, I know I just need a little bit. We Three can minutes. Go, we can go ahead and have a very brief break, restroom break, um, if we must, and then let's let's get back as soon as possible. No more than five minutes. Let's try to make it three. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Dr. Paris, can you take a quick roll call just to make sure we have our quorum back? Absolutely. Um, Dr. Dion McClain. Present. Dr. David Paris, present. Dr. Lawrence Adams. Present. Ms. Jeanette Cruz. Present. Dr. Pamela Daniels. Present. Mr. Raphael Sweet. Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. And with that, I turn it back over to you, Your Honor, for the final petitioner. All right. Thank you. Mr. Abbey, you're back and ready to go on the record. Ms. Haro, you're ready to go on the record? Yes. And Dr. Foley, you're ready to go on the record? Yes. All right. Then we are on the record in the petition for early termination of probation being brought by Michael John Foley. This matter is being heard before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. It is Board case number AC 2018-1206, and it is OAH case number 2021-120851. My name is Sean Gavin. I'm the Administrative Law Judge presiding over this matter. Can I take the appearances of the parties starting with counsel? Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro on behalf of the people. Thank you, Ms. Haro. Dr. Foley, you are appearing today by video conference without the assistance of an attorney. Is that correct? That's correct. Prior to going on the hearing, on the record of this hearing, I explained the procedures and you also witnessed two prior petition matters. Do you have any questions about the procedures that will follow today, Ms. Dr. Foley? Um, I don't, Your Honor. All right. Then if that's the case, Ms. Haro, you can proceed with your presentation of the petition packet when you are ready. Thank you. I'm Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General's Office pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I'm here today to assist in fact-finding, and my role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I'm here to ensure that there's adequate information from which to make a decision. I would first like to mark for identification and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the petition packet with accompanying documents. The petitioner has also been provided a copy of the same set of this exhibit. 
Exhibit 1 generally consists of the petition for early termination of probation, eight certificates of completion uh, for continuing education, including six hours of ethics courses, the probation status report, the accusation in board case number 2018-1206, the board's decision and order, the letter to petitioner giving notice of hearing and proof of service dated December 29th, 2021, and a second letter to petitioner giving notice of hearing and the login information uh, and the petition packet with proof of service dated January 13th, 2022. At this time, I offer this packet into evidence as Exhibit 1. Dr. Foley, do you object? No. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Thank you. I'll now provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. On January 1st, 1985, the board issued chiropractic license number DC 17135 to petitioner. Petitioner's chiropractic license was revoked, but the revocation was stayed and his license was placed on probation for four years with terms and conditions. That probation took effect on July 26th, 2019. On January 3rd, 2019, the board filed accusation number AC 2018 dash 1206 against petitioner. The accusation alleged five causes for disciplinary action against petitioner. Those grounds were for unprofessional conduct, sexual misconduct, unprofessional conduct, sexual acts and erotic behavior at place of business, unprofessional conduct, moral turpitude and dishonesty, Unprofessional conduct endanger the health, welfare, and safety of patients, and unprofessional conduct gross negligence. The accusation arose from petitioner's sexual relationship with a patient that lasted from 2015 through 2017. Petitioner is now petitioning for early termination of his probation. Because the burden is on petitioner, I have no further statements but reserve the right to question petitioner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haro. <clears throat> Dr. Foley, that takes us then to you. If you'd like to testify on your own behalf, I'll have you raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, you can put your hand down if you'd like. I'll have you state and spell your name for the record. Michael John Foley, DC, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, J-O-H-N-F-O-L-I-D-C. All right, thank you. As I said at the beginning, this is your opportunity to explain in your own words what you think the board should know when deciding whether to grant the relief requested. You may begin when you are ready. Um, so um, you're pretty much asking me the reason why I feel I should um, have the right to potentially have my probation terminated early? Well, it, it's up to you how you'd like to proceed. Um, you can highlight or emphasize portions of your petition if you'd like. Alternatively, you can um, choose not to provide any additional testimony at this time and just answer questions that Ms. Haro and or the board members may have. Um, you can do some combination of those things. It's really up to you. Um, you know, in an effort to expedite, I know you guys have a busy day. Um, I think your questions are probably going to cover everything I would present. So I think we could go directly to the questioning if you'd like. All right. Then, Ms. Haro, if you have questions for this witness, you may ask them when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kimes, on your petition packet on page BCE3, uh, question three, your response was that you've been in continuous solo practice from July 26th to the present. The, it looks like the year was omitted on that. Can you just tell us how long you've been in solo practice? Um, you know, I, I want to make a correction on the record that I'm not Dr. Kimes, I'm Dr. Foley. 
if that's I apologize. Point. I am so sorry. Okay. Uh, Dr. Foley, I, I apologize. Can you tell us how long you, Dr. Foley, have been in solo practice? Um, you know, I graduated from college uh, on March 15th, 1985. I was not licensed on January 1st, which was previously stated as well. I don't know that this matters. I got my license on July 26th, I believe, 1985. In, in the state of California. So I've been in practice since that time. And has it been solo practice that entire time? Yes, it has. Thank you. I, I worked for, I worked and shared an office the first couple of years with uh, another chiropractor, but since 1988, I've been in my own solo practice, yes. 1988, you said? Yes. Thank you. On in response to the questions on the petition, uh, question four, you put that you took a course on sexual boundaries. Yes, I did. What was the most important thing you learned in that course? The most important thing that I learned was our, my fiduciary responsibility to keep a doctor-patient relationship and never to have it go beyond that point. Um, fiduciary, meaning that it's strictly doctor-patient and nothing outside of that. What was, why do you understand that to be important? For the well-being of the patient to keep things focused as well as to not, um, just not to be a distraction a, into their treatment. And what procedures uh, do you have in place now to maintain clear professional boundaries with your patients? Um, we have our complete our, our office completely open um, without any closed doors. Um, we have um, um, a female present when we uh, see any female patients I have, which is typically my wife in there. Um, I have a female present during um, x-ray, during or a, a female monitor um, present during x-ray, during examination, um, basically all the time when I have a female patient. How is that different from what your practice was like in 2017 and earlier? Um, I didn't have a female monitor with me. I'd never felt the need to. I'd, I'd never had a complaint. I'd never had an issue uh, of any sort. Um, I didn't feel it was necessary. Um, and uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I know you can see in my... Um, what I'd sent to you guys, the paperwork I sent, that we are going to keep this uh, procedure beyond if, if uh, when my termination ends, whether it's now or whether it's in um, 2023. You said that one of the things your office has now is an open floor plan and no doors. Did you, when did you implement that physical structure to your office? Um, let me explain. We didn't change any of the structure of the office. We um, had some curtains um, for visual privacy, but not uh, too much uh, auditory privacy. Um, I have moved the desk I'm presently sitting at is my wife's desk. And on the other side, I can flip my computer around to show you um, where she is directly looking at our largest adjusting room where I see my female patients almost exclusively on occasion. If we have a repetition of uh, female patients, we may place them in another room. And then in that case, we would have either her or the other monitor get up and observe in there. So um, we, we moved and have a station, a desk back where she can be at her desk as well as being present for female patients for regular adjustments. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. I thank you, Ms. Hara. That takes us then to our board members, and I will start with you once again with Dr. McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Foley, I just have one question. 
on BCE stamped uh, page 002, the questions that ask uh, of one, two, three. The third question down, have you ever had disciplinary action taken against any professional license in this state or any other? You replied no on your petitioner um, packet, on your application for uh, petition for early termination. Are you aware that that includes your current situation? My current situation, no, I'm not. No, you're not aware that that sh answer should have been included that by it says any license in this state or any other state. So by virtue of your disciplinary action today, um, not today, but the four years probation, that's what I'm asking. Oh, I, I didn't realize I was supposed to list that, no. Okay, no problem. Um, I have nothing further, thank you. All right, Dr. Paris. Hi, Dr. Foley. Thank you for being here today. I have uh, I have one question, actually, maybe a two part. But in in the uh, your statement in the petition for early termination of probation under B, you wrote that the paperwork I'm required to have patients sign tends to cause a negative impression. For example, I have had potential new patients refuse treatment once the paperwork was presented for their review and signature. And I, I'm just I'm wondering. Um, like your thought process, if you could walk me through how how that would supersede, you know, their right to know. And how else do you do you feel like they should not be notified, or do you feel like the the process of notifying them is problematic? Um, I believe that. Um Going through the process, the paperwork, um, I, I just don't feel that I'm a threat at all because um, my wife is with me all the time in the office. Um, the incident that occurred was uh, a one time thing that I, I'd never had any other uh, problems before this. I, ha I have been married um, since August 16th. 2018 and I'm happily married. I just uh, with is that uh, answer your question correctly or thoroughly well, I should say. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think your answer is the correct answer. It, it, you know, I'm not looking for anything specific. I'm just, I'm trying to get a feel for, um, you know, when, when you're answering uh, this question and using it as a, a reason why we should consider, um, you know, terminating probation early. I, I just wanted to get hear your thoughts on, you know, like what the patient's rights would be and if you would write that again, considering their right to know, or do you just feel like the amount of time has passed that they no longer have the right to know? Um. That's a that's a difficult question for me to ask. I, I don't want to be the judge on whether or not uh, a patient would have the right to know. I know in my heart that I don't feel that uh, I'm a threat to any of my patients or the public um, at this time. Um, it's, uh, so I, I, again, I, I don't know that I'm at uh, authority to make that judgment. Uh, all I can do is, is uh, state that I, I don't feel that I'm of any threat to uh, any patient, male or female, at this time. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that question. Thank you. No more questions. All right. Thank you. Dr. Adams, any questions? I have no questions at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Dr. Daniels. 
Yes, hi, Dr. Foley. Um, so I just want to uh, be clear. So you had, if I'm reading this correctly, uh, sexual relations with the particular person in your office? Um, it's somebody, somebody who had been a pa patient and uh, evidently currently was to consider to still be a current patient. And so the way you phrase it, did you not dismiss them as a patient once? Um, no, I, I had, um, the person had been coming in for a work related injury um, and had been released from my care um, from that, but it still continued. Um, I, um, in between, if you looked at the history, I'm sure you saw the history on the, the paperwork of, oh, it was over. She'd come in initially for a injury related uh, treatment back in, I think, 2011. Had come in for several visits uh, interim that time, uh, just as, uh, you know, a cash patient and then it returned in 2015 um, for a work related injury. Okay. Um, and we're, I mean, when we take the ethics test, there is clear questions on, you know, no sexual conduct, conduct with inner office. Um, when that was occurring, did that not occur to you or? Um, you know, I, I did clouded judgment. I, I started seeing things in my own eyes, admittedly. Um, at this time, um, I had been separated of my wife uh, of 25 years. I was in a bad place. Um, I uh, probably got clouded with the judgment that having relations with somebody that you're their doctor, but um, she was obviously not a spouse, but, you know, in that uh, gray area of significant other. And again, it, it was my judgment. It, it uh, it's I'm not uh, denying my guilt or not taking responsibility, I, I, but that was my thought process at the time. I believe it, it's been a number of years, but uh, I was in a bad place and I was completely wrong and I'm not uh, again denying any fault on this. Thank you. I appreciate your answers and no further questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Ms. Cruz, any questions? No questions. Mr. Sweet? No questions. All right. Um, let me just leave it open for just one more moment. Any final board questions? All right. Seeing none. Dr. Foley, any additional statements you'd like to make on your own behalf? You know, I thought you guys might cover some more stuff after watching the previous uh, two cases. Um, again, I just I just added that I, I was in a bad place in that time, um, you know, having, um, you know, um, being separated and uh, eventually getting divorced from my wife of 25 years. Um, I. Uh, When it, some of the things that, that are difficult with this, um, aside from the presentation of uh, to my patients, new patients, or you know somebody returning with the with the paperwork, um, informing them of my probation status, a couple of things. I have a lot of patients that have been with me many years. Um, I've been removed from all managed care. I have a lot of patients with managed care that rely on their managed care for support financially with their chiropractic care, uh, I'm unable to, you know, they're all cash patients because I'm unable to provide for them, which I kind of bite my tongue because I'm not real excited about all the managed care, to be honest, but um, this is something that's uh, difficult for me, you know, again, for patients that have been with me many years. Um, I also had been with the same malpractice um, carrier for the last 10 years um, with uh, the Philadelphia Insurance Company is who I was insured with. During the last two and a half years of probation, they continued to insure me. They stopped just recently at the end of uh, 2021, have stopped insurance chiro insuring chiropractors. Um, they, my agent has now, they have, new, have a new insurance company who, because I have this issue going, 
um, or I, they won't insure me, won't even hear my, um, you know, any response to it. And in my search for insurance, malpractice insurance, the only thing I'm able to get uh, to me is not the most reputable insurance company. I can't get an admitted insurance company. So um, I guess if I had to add anything else, that that would be it. Your Honor. All right. Um, as you saw for the other petitioners, you do also have the right to call additional third party witnesses or present additional documents. Do you have either of those things you'd like to present at this time? Um, no, I, I think I um, have everything thorough. All right. And um, you did provide some additional testimony. Let me see one final time if there are any additional board questions or questions from Ms. Oro. All right, seeing none, that takes us then to closing argument. Ms. Haro, if you'd like to make any closing remarks, you may do so now. No closing, thank you. All right, Dr. Foley, if you'd like to say any closing remarks, you may do so when you're ready. You know, I would just like to thank you guys for the board and for uh, the DA at the time for allowing me to practice on a state license. Um, I've been a chiropractor for 36 years now, and it, uh, I truly think this is my gift. It's not something I'm uh, anticipating any retirement anytime soon. I've been serving a lot of these people for many years, and you know, I just will not take um, for granted the privilege I have to take care of these people. Um, I've also, you know, had a just renewed feeling of, you know, it's it's. As being a chiropractor, it's not just what I do in the office, but it's what I do 100% of the time anywhere in any place. So I want to thank you for this opportunity and the opportunity to be heard uh, to on this uh, petition. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Foley. In a moment, I'm going to ask whether the matter is submitted. And by that, I mean, are you satisfied you've had a full opportunity to present all evidence and make all argument on your behalf? Ms. Haro, is the matter submitted? Yes, submitted. And Dr. Foley? Yes, thank you. All right, and the matter is submitted. The case is closed and we are off the record. Ms. Straub, any spellings that you need? All right, then when you're, whenever it's convenient for you, Ms. Straub, I'll just need the um, time of completion and estimated number of pages. Time was 1249. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Straub. I know we went a little longer than you expected, but I appreciate your time and efforts as always. And Dr. McLean, I'll turn it back over to you now. And I'd also like to thank you, Ms. Straub. And at this time, I uh, would like to move forward to the next agenda item, which is we will now be going into closed session. So if the moderator can um, determine who should stay and sh who should go, we will move into closed session. Thank you. This is the moderator. I will get um, our panelists secured and I think I need this is Dixie I think I need to switch to my computer so that I can um okay. handle opening and closing it 